Despite rising interest rates, now may be a time to consider a fixer-upper. But before you say yes, here's what to consider to avoid ending up in a money pit. I'm a millennial who's finally ready to buy a house, but feeling very discouraged about the current market situation. Frustrated would-be home buyers taken to social media. The market is absolutely insane. In total, I saw about 10 houses over the course of two weeks. A combination of high interest rates and low inventory are leaving many would-be buyers on the outside looking in. Last year, home prices hit a record high, and the National Association of Realtors estimates the median home price will go up again this year to $386,000. But real estate experts say home buyers may find more bang for their buck with a fixer-upper. I'm starting to see house prices decrease specifically in the houses that are fixer-upper. Ethan Shin is a real estate windows. agent in Florida. In South Florida right now, we're seeing turnkey homes that are a million plus and this house that we're standing in right now, Vicki, it's half the price of that. I joined Shin and his client Joe Donovic as they looked at fixer-uppers near West Palm Beach, Florida. Joe's budget, $450,000, plus an extra $100,000 for repairs. You ready to go take a look? Certainly am. First, this three-bedroom home. Despite some cosmetic issues, older appliances, and interesting wallpaper, it's in pretty good shape, except for one big potential expense. The windows, we get big hurricanes in Florida. So replacing these windows with complete impact windows is vital for up to code and that can leave you spending an extra 50 to 70 grand on impact windows for the whole house. The asking price $490,000. Next, this three bedroom home in a popular neighborhood. Come on guys, after you. Oh wow. It needs a lot of work. This is definitely rough compared to the last one. I mean, I really don't think that I could work with most of that kitchen or at least it would be a really big project for me to undertake. All of these floorboards aren't even put together. And then if you see in this closet as well, there's also a discoloration. Lots of things can be fixed up inside of a house, but this one I noticed, there's a busy road right out over the backyard wall. We know that you can't change the location of the house. So having a busy road right in your backyard over the wall is not something that a buyer may want. Even so, the house is listed for 525000 Finally, this four-bedroom home. Joe, first impression? Yeah, so I love the Toronto floors. That is something that I'm actually after. And the fact that there's a lot of light from the sunroom, I could see that being a perfect office for me. But the floors may need to be refinished, and the backyard has seen better days. I see here that it says I can't use the sink. Yes, the agent did disclose to me that there is an active leak in the vanity. The asking price, 469000 Welcome back to Moonlight Manor. Michelle Bowers started renovating homes as a hobby during the pandemic and documents her projects on social media. What should home buyers look for? We always look for stains in the ceiling. If you can access the attic or any crawl space up above there, look to make sure there's nothing wet up there, signs of mold. She says water damage is a big red flag. The roof needs repairs or replacing. That can be a $100,000 fix. She also says shop for salvaged or secondhand items. Try to reuse materials from the home itself. And when it comes to lumber, you can look for local lumber yards, old sawmills, which is what we go to a lot. Lumber's cheaper. It's usually old growth lumber. Finally, expect the unexpected. I would build in a 20%, 25% additional amount of money just for the things that pop up along the way. Because they always do. Yes, they always do. <laughs> Michelle also says know your limitations. If you can't do it yourself, find a licensed contractor and talk to their references. Also, try to go see their previous work in person if possible. And when you are getting those quotes, don't always choose the cheapest one. Look for the most reliable contractor you can find. Now to one of the most important places in your home, the kitchen. We all do our best to keep it clean, but there may be germs lurking in places you would not expect. Take a look. This is the top dirtiest item in the kitchen, the spices. You would be surprised. In fact, the researchers at the USDA were shocked when they found this out. Here's what they did. They took 371 people and said, hey, could you make some turkey burgers with seasoning for us and a salad? And everybody thought they were trying out new recipes. No, what they were doing was observing how oh. these people cook in the kitchen. And it ended up when they tested the surfaces more than half of the time, these spice uh, jars had the most contamination. Because you're touching your stuff and then touching the spice jars. It's literally it. a worst case scenario because you're handling the meat, you're forming 
forming the patties, and yes. then you're like, oh, gotta add the onion powder or the salt, the pepper. Yes. And you don't think, let me go back and wipe those down. And sometimes people aren't washing their hands during mm. meal prep between each thing. Okay. So in your cooking show, you would do the mise en place, right? <laughs> cooking show. You would yes. actually put the well, ingredients out. And, and yes, Hoda and I were just talking about, like, yeah. I like to put it out because otherwise I obsessively check the recipe 500 yeah, times, <laughs> like, at, per minute. So I just try to put it all in the thing, and then I don't have to check again how much I It's need a up. smart thing to do okay. to avoid cross-contamination as okay. well. And if you're worried about it, look, pathogens don't live very long on surfaces. Just give these a wash a in hot down. soapy water or okay. wipe down. Okay, speaking of soap, soap and water, this, I would imagine, was one of the cleanest places, but actually the sink is one of the germiest? Yes, so you okay. look at the sink, the handle, and the soap dispenser. Okay, what do so you think is the germiest, Hoda? Probably the sink. So according to this yeah. study, it was the soap dispenser. And here's why. Your hands are gross. That's when you touch the soap, oh. and then you wash them. So that so makes this, sense, So this, the outside right? stays yucky. Exactly. So if you're worried about that, look, just wash that Wipe when that you down. wash your hands every yeah. once in a while. Yes, the faucet and the sink. They say to clean out your entire sink every night. If you're a big meal prepper, look, you're putting eggs in there, poultry, meats. You're going to want to wash that with hot soapy with? water. You can also use a mix of bleach, one to two oh. tablespoons okay. of bleach per gallon of water. That's another great disinfectant. Okay. And of course, the regular ones that are on the market. Yeah, things you don't think you need to clean, but you right, definitely, but you definitely do. do. Okay. The thing we use to clean is sponges. It's pretty grim. Okay, so we <laughs> know about grim. sponges. Sponges, they're wet mm -hmm. and they're cold and they're a place where bacteria love to live. So the USDA actually says you can microwave your sponge one mm -hmm. to two minutes. That'll kill off most things. Some people recommend throwing it in the dishwasher. I would just say make sure your dishwasher has a really strong drying cycle because the key here is to keep everything dry. Right. When it comes to your dish cloths, yep. a good best practice they say to swap them out every day. I feel mm -hmm. like that's a lot of laundry. If that's not realistic for you, at least make sure you're hanging up your dishcloth in a place where it's going to be fully getting dry. Because again, you want to avoid moisture. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's nice is having a different, um, we do this in our house. We have hand cloths for drying our hands. Right. We have a different cloth that you use for drying the dishes. Mm -hmm. And then we have another cloth for cleaning the counters. Yeah. So that wow. helps keep everything separate. Hmm. That's a lot of dishes. This How is, this is a, oh, go ahead. No, how often should you replace those sponges? Because I feel like ours hang around forever and yeah. ever. I know. So the rule of thumb is, look, yeah. if it's getting dingy, like yeah. it's falling apart, tattered, that's like it's far yeah. too gone if yeah. it starts to smell bad. Yeah. But it really depends. Some people aren't really in their kitchen that yeah. much. So one sponge could right. last them a month. For someone else, it's a week. <laughs> okay. yeah. Vic, let's talk about these cutting boards here. They're on the list as well. Why yeah. is that? All right. So whether it's plastic or wood, Craig, when you are cutting in a cutting board, those grooves become a breeding ground for bacteria. They love to live the in the little nooks and yeah, and the grooves that are made by your knife. Oh. So the best practice here is actually double washing your cutting board, meaning you wash it with the soap and sponge, uh -huh. the hot water, then you throw it in the dishwasher. Oh. That's the recommendation. The number one thing to do as well, make sure they are dry before you put them away. You don't want to be putting away a damp cutting board, especially not a wooden mm. one. And then finally, a different one for your meat for mm. your poultry, for your fruits and vegetables. That is the, the key to preventing cross-contamination. Do the plastic germ, do the plastic cutting boards carry as many germs as the wooden? Mm -hmm. They say in the cuts of the grooves, it really doesn't make a big difference. Okay. So right. yeah, don't don't have a false sense of security with plastic. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, Vic, in about 30 seconds here, give okay. me, we got a produce drawer, we got yeah. a meat drawer from the fridge. You guys have a well-stocked fridge, because I know Siri cooks. Yeah. A great thing to do is line the refrigerator doors with paper towels to catch all the juice and the drippings, mm -hmm. and it's easy to take that out and throw it away. Mm -hmm. Real simple, cleaning experts say, Clean out your entire fridge once every season. Mm -hmm. And you can seriously just wash these with soap and water or use a wipe across the inside or give them a good spray. Again, let them dry. Follow the directions to make sure that all the bacteria is dead. Okay, and what are the shrimp and what are these doing? Oh, okay, so you definitely <laughs> want to put any of your raw meat right into the produce bag before you put it in. Extra layer of protection exactly. when you put it in. Exactly, yeah. so you okay. don't get all the... Those have been out a while. I might not eat those. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure to properly clean those areas and items to prevent cross-contamination and harmful bacteria. Up next, what you need to know before buying a car in 2023. And are you thinking about going electric? There are things to consider before making that switch. That's all ahead on Consumer Confidential. We'll be right back.
We are back with Consumer Confidential. After two years of surging prices, car buyers are hoping to finally get back in the driver's seat this year. But while the market for used cars is softening, new vehicles are setting records with sky-high prices. Here's NBC's Sam Brock with more. For drivers who've braved pandemic sticker shock, the road to buying a car hasn't just been bumpy. It's been a financial sinkhole. We couldn't really find anything brand new. And, to, and the used cars were the prices of what we thought the brand new cars were going to be priced for. Brittany Alexander and Candon Rodriguez, just two of the car shoppers who bought or leased in the last year. Though they were still stunned to learn the average price tag for a new vehicle. In December, a staggering $49,507. When I told you $50,000, your reaction is what? That's terrible. <laughs> that is. No, because like a lot of people don't make that annually. So how can you afford to buy a car if you don't have that money? In addition to soaring rents and inflated grocery bills, cars have also been pinching consumer wallets with some of the underlying issues like supply chain disruptions, lack of semiconductors and labor shortages still a problem, but stabilizing. I would say the situation has improved significantly on all three of those fronts, but there are still some constraints in the supply, so we're not completely out of the woods. As vehicle supplies tick back up, you'll notice that there's a better selection of certain kinds of cars, the ones that turn a higher profit margin. You're still seeing automakers um, putting constrained components in high value cars. So the most profitable cars are the ones that they're willing to build. So pickups and SUVs are becoming more, you know, more available. This in turn has revved up the average cost of vehicles dramatically. But check out this split. While year over year inflation for new cars rose 6.2% in December, it plummeted 8.8% for used cars and trucks, a significant reversal. Carvana, the second largest used car retailer in the country, is expanding its signature car vending machines from 33 to 37 in the coming months, including the newest one in Denver. The company is optimistic about the new year and banking on a boost from tax season. Still, even with used car costs coming down, the industry-wide jolt has left many shoppers, like Miami lawyer Brooks LaRue, out of options. I don't see how anyone could afford a car right now, new or used, without going into significant debt. Thank you, Sam. Well, given the unpredictability of gas prices, there has been growing interest in electric vehicles with a record number sold just last year. But will making the switch from gas to an electric powered vehicle really save you money? Here's what you need to know before making the switch. We aren't flying high Jetson style. But the future of cars and trucks is here with many automakers electrifying their lineups. The all new, all electric. EQS SUV. Some, like Cadillac, vowing to go all electric by 2030 and Lexus by 2035, fueled in part by consumer demand to go green and ditch unpredictable fuel prices. A recent survey revealing more than a third of Americans would consider buying or leasing an EV when in the market for a new ride. But right now, it's tough finding cars, especially electric ones. Why is it so hard to get your hands on an electric vehicle? There's difficulty in the industry building vehicles in general and EVs being the newest thing on the block with the latest technology are just more difficult to build and ultimately the supply is just not there. Alex Nizek is an automotive engineer at Consumer Reports. When it comes to price, you may experience a little sticker shock. On average, a new EV now costs around $64,000, nearly 16,000 more than the overall industry average. If you compare similar models, a new gas-powered Hyundai Kona costs around $22,000. The electric version, nearly $34,000. But shifting gears from gas to electric can help you save money down the road when it comes to gas and maintenance. A Consumer Reports study found a typical EV owner who mostly charges at home can save up to $1,000 a year on fueling costs, with gas now at more than $3 a gallon. And Nizek says EVs usually spend less time in the shop, saving owners about $4,600 in maintenance and repair fees over the car's lifetime when compared to gas-powered vehicles. The reason for that is EVs tend to have less moving parts. And Nizek says electric vehicles usually require fewer routine checkups. A quick look under the hood, you can see it's usually a storage space. There's no need to replace oil filters or parts like spark plugs. What questions should you ask yourself before you buy an EV? It depends on how you drive and where you drive. If you're taking a lot of road trips and you're going to have to rely on the public charging uh, infrastructure and you're going to be waiting longer and taking more stops to charge the vehicle. 
When planning a long road trip, remember most EVs have a driving range of a little more than 200 miles. And when using a public fast charger, it can take 25 to 60 minutes to juice up. While California and New York have the most charging stations by volume, Vermont has the most per capita. And by 2030, the federal government plans to build a national network of 500,000 EV chargers. Nizick says if you mostly take short trips, running errands or carpooling, look for charging options around town, at work, and especially at home. You can get a basic charging outlet installed in your own garage. Just make sure you hire a licensed electrician. Costs vary, but start around 200 bucks. Depending on where you live, electricity could cost more than gas, and cold weather or extreme heat can drastically reduce an EV's range. Nizek urges consumers to also consider reliability. As more EVs roll out, Nizek says if you can wait, avoid buying first-year models. Allow some time for manufacturers to work out the kinks. All tips to make your next ride a smooth one. While EVs cost more on average, under the Inflation Reduction Act, you can receive a federal tax credit up to $7,500 when buying a new EV or $4,000 for a used one. Coming up, it's become a hot target for thieves. Catalytic converters. Learn how to make it harder for crooks to steal yours. Plus, a breakdown of some of the best money-saving hacks that are currently dominating social media. We're back right after this. Welcome back. It is a device found in almost every car and it has become one of the hottest items for thieves. It's called the catalytic converter and once it's gone, your car makes a ton of noise and really can't run. Replacing that catalytic converter can cost thousands, but there are some simple things you can do to prevent this kind of theft from happening to you. Across the country, thieves caught on camera. Brazen thefts of catalytic converters in broad daylight. In November, a federal takedown of a criminal network dealing in stolen catalytic converters, 21 arrests across the U.S., and $545 million in assets seized, including homes, cash, and luxury vehicles. What makes converters so hot? They contain precious metals like rhodium, palladium, and platinum. Right now, rhodium alone valued at more than $12,000 per ounce, and it's consumers who pay the price. It can cost anywhere from two to $5,000 to have a mechanic replace your catalytic converter. So what can you do to protect this very valuable part of your car? With me now is Sergeant Justin Mount of the Orlando Police Department. Thank you so much. So first, let me ask you, how easy is it for them to get under and steal one of these? It's very simple, Vicki. Basically, all they do is they just make a couple cuts 
Remove the O2 sensor and they're gone in 60 seconds or less. Under a minute? Under a minute. What are some things consumers can do to protect their catalytic converters? Well, here's an option for people. It's a shield and oh, wow. essentially it just goes and bolts right up to basically block the catalytic converter okay. and uh, you can have your mechanic install it. There's smaller ones that they make, you know, cages that just protect around the catalytic converter. And it's not necessarily going to stop them from stealing it. It just might make it harder and be more of that deterrent that uh, makes them move on to the next vehicle. Shields can cost anywhere from two to $600. Sergeant Mount also recommends having a mechanic engrave the VIN or vehicle identification number on the catalytic converter and coat it with a bright high temperature paint. One can cost less than 15 bucks. Some police departments also offer kits like this to etch a unique code registered to your car's VIN. Police in Orlando investigating a growing number of cases, more than 300 in 2022. That's up 618 percent from two years ago. Nationally, cases up 1,215 percent. They come in from out of town. Yeah. They'll come in for a weekend, they'll hit us hard, and they're gone. Sergeant Mount says when parking at a hotel or mall, choose interior spots to make it harder for thieves to get under your car. And pay attention if you see anyone walking around with a cordless saw. Right then and there, that should tell you like something is not right. Mm -hmm. And go ahead, call 911. Get a good description, whether it's the vehicle or a tag. And when you're home, the idea is to park in your garage if you can. But what if you've got to park in a driveway or on the street? What should you be thinking about? Lighting is huge. Better lit. The driveway is, the better you're going to be as far sure. as deterring criminals. Spotlights are also very good. What about security cameras? They're relatively inexpensive now. The ones that they have are battery operated and they have good quality video. So they're, they're very helpful when it comes to evidence that we can use to solve these crimes. When you have all this stuff installed, is that also potentially a deterrent to the thieves? Yes, these guys are going to see that and they'll move on to the next. These crimes can be hard to solve. Sergeant Mount says spread the word by sharing pictures, security camera video, and details about any thefts with your neighborhood group or websites like Nextdoor. People can help you gather the clues yes. by getting descriptions, license plates. That's where it starts. If we have that as a lead, man, that goes a long way. If your converter is stolen, you should call your insurance company to see if they will cover the replacement. Not everyone has the proper coverage, though, so it is a good idea to double check right now what kind of insurance coverage you have before something like this happens to you. Up next, the money-saving tips dominating social media right now. Social media is filled with videos of people coming up with creative ways to spend less and save more. NBC's business reporter Brian Chung recently spoke to our friends on the third hour of today and broke down some of the most popular hacks. First of all, why are social media users especially like so interested in these, these finance hacks? Yeah, well, I mean, right now, look, inflation is high. People are concerned about what the economic outlook is going to look like this year. So people are saying, I got to try and be more mindful about my saving and also my spending. But then also, 
Interest rates are going to go up. Okay. The expectation is tomorrow the Federal Reserve will continue to raise interest rates. That means your credit card rates are going to remain high. Your mortgage rates are going to remain high. So all these things are making people more mindful. They're taking to TikTok. They're taking to Instagram. Yeah. It's popping off with a lot of these types of trends. So how are they trying to gamify spending specifically? Yeah, well, gamifying, trying to make it more engaging. And, and one thing that you can kind of take a look at as an example is the no spend challenge. Essentially what you do is you print out a calendar and then you look at your spending. So the days where you uh, don't spend on things that you don't need that extra sweatshirt that you just didn't need to have, uh, you're going to color that in, in green. But the days that you mm. do spend on things that you don't need, you're going to highlight that in red. That's totally okay. Right. But the idea is just to highlight your wins, make sure that you're building good habits and aware of the days when you're spending on things that you don't need. And by the way, if you put gas into your car yeah. to get to work, that, that doesn't count. That's yeah, something that you need. What great. about these exactly. apps? You yeah. say you use apps to help? Yeah, there are apps like uh, You Need a Budget okay. and Mint. If you don't want to print out an actual calendar, a lot of people don't have printers, so you can use digital versions as well. Okay. That's I a think, great idea. I do think it's fun to make it fun. Yeah, it's a competition you know, I, in a way. It, it, it is, yeah. of course. And I love uh, this whole envelope idea as a way to save money. Yeah, so this is really great. It's called the Envelope Savings Challenge. And I think we've got the props actually yes. right here. So essentially what you do is you're going to take 100 envelopes and you're going to number them 1 to 100. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to just draw one every single day okay. right, at random. So let's say, for example, I pulled up a 69 out here. <laughs> and then what you're going to do is you're going to take uh, some hard cash, which I happen to have in my pocket right Very here. Nice. And then you're going to basically say, all right, I'm going to put $69 into this envelope. Okay. And then you put it away. Oh. And essentially what you're doing is that you're accumulating that savings over time and 100 envelopes. It's going to get you five thousand and fifty dollars in a hundred days. It's a substantial amount Just of money. Just by pulling in. Yep, exactly. And, and by the way, days are easy. You can scale this days. down too. Mm -hmm. So if you only can do, let's say, for example, That's fifty really days, well, okay. then that'll accumulate about one thousand two hundred seventy-five dollars if I. Did the math right? Twenty-five would be three hundred twenty-five. Well, now you're so just showing up. I'm just, you know, look, I'm the data <laughs> reporter after. Oh, all, look right? at me! So, I can crunch numbers. <laughs> hey, I'm killing it. You know. All right. No, this so, is a really great idea. So, Brian, how do you combine all these ideas to actually? you know, put this together and make this part of your life. Yeah, well, it's important to remember that savings is one part of it mm -hmm. and then spending is the other part of it, right? So if you've got a few spare envelopes like I have right here, mm -hmm. you can do a zero budgeting challenge. You mm -hmm. can basically put a category like, oh, <laughs> moving over this way. Uh, you can do, for example, groceries for $200, right? You can also say, well, for the internet bill, I'm going to put $80 in, right? You're going to break the cash into these categories or, for example, glasses for Chanel, right? You can uh -huh. say, all right, I'm going <laughs> to save up with these envelopes. But once you put the money in there and then once it's gone, it's gone. And the idea here is to curb overspending. So for your boy, for example, right, sneakers, right. $200, right? I buy too much when sure. it comes to sneakers, mm -hmm. right? Once I've spent through this, that's it for the month. It's a mm -hmm. way to police and make sure that you're just kind of mindful of how much that. How much nice do those sneakers? cost? These are about $200. <laughs> okay, there you go. All right. So I burn through the month. There I'm done. Yeah. All right, why don't you go over to Mr. Magoo right. here? So we have Mr. Magoo. <laughs> <laughs> we have about one minute left. This is yeah. big. All over TikTok now, people are talking about side hustles. I saw one yesterday, and I'm like, maybe I should sell T-shirts. Um, <laughs> Because <laughs> they make it seem like it's so simple. Hey, extra money is money, yeah. right? I mean, I think what, what was Drake said that the as long as the outcome is income. So did I you think just we, quote Drake. I did just okay. quote Drake. Impressive. But look, all this is about high inflation right now. People are looking for ways to get extra money. Yeah. We've seen a lot of trends on TikTok. I've seen people set up vending machines. Yeah. I saw someone set up an inflatable nightclub in their backyard. Wow. They charge entry to get inside the nightclub. Wow. People would do it. People would do it. But yeah. the important thing here, that's the nightclub right there. Wow. Oh Look goodness. how impressive that is. But that is expensive. I looked it up, folks, right? Yeah. Don't invest more than you can lose in these side hustles. That it's is cost important. You. Yes. Why would you take on more debt yep. if you're trying to pay off debt? And also finally. set boundaries. Even if the money works out, time is money. It takes time to that's set up good. these side hustles. Thanks, Brian. And that is our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Nguyen. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. 
Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William Franz Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960, or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists, and Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Ducky Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eatery is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Ducky Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duck Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Ducky Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po'boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase, Jr. and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Dookie Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china, she wanted linens, she wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace but that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall. The list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that 
until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that point where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chase's when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades, from red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Dukey. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. The gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter Four. Being a fourth generation African-American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. We it's are great enjoying food. everything. Yeah. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase, Chase to, to get, get myself my... some gumbo. When, when the service, service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together.
A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's Restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X according to Professor Psyche williams Porson, The heart of civil rights is America, because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's. Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzie Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events just four years apart sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken.
Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, wow. it's, it's so, so good, good to see, see you. It's been so long. It's been mm. way too long. I've missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, my baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's in. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, Sylvia used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So, did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. Now is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh-huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, yeah. See how gently he's putting it in there? Putting the baby to bed. Yep. They'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Wow. I, I feel her. I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. You better <laughs> pick, up your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow. That looks perfect. Now, this now is you're worth, a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what you're going person. for. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect? Wow, the seasoning, moist, crisp. Oh. Your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this piece to go. Oh, I'm going to pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I can come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and uh, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas, and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab, you know, once it became popularized, but in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ain't here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activists U.E.P. Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come through the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting our pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course, grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. Hello and welcome to The Boost. I'm Chanel Jones in for Hoda, excited to bring you some good news and positive vibes. And today is all about spreading kindness from the gift of a song to a cheery bouquet of flowers to a simple act of generosity. We hope we can inspire you to spread kindness in your own life. First up, did you know this is National Play Tennis Day? And we are spotlighting two sisters making the sport more accessible to kids all around the world. Here's our Jenna Bush Hager. 16-year-old Ayana and 18-year-old Amani Shaw love to serve. I think more kids should play tennis because it's a phenomenal way to build character. Tennis has taught me so many lessons and I think the biggest one is learning how to push through obstacles. Second serve! And since 2019, their nonprofit organization Second Serve has been working to give kids around the world equitable access to tennis. When I was 10 years old was when I really fell in love with the sport. The relationships that I've built through tennis have been just amazing. Historically, tennis has been deemed an elitist sport because of its very high cost to entry. Second Serve redistributes new and gently used tennis equipment all around the world. Our mission is to create greater access, inclusion, and diversity within the sport. Oh, good shot. <laughs> One of my personal favorite donations was to a young girl in Nigeria named Nana Rosen. I stopped at Play Tennis since I was two years old. Nana spends four to five hours every day playing tennis. And her dedication is really an inspiration for us. Ayana and Amani tap teens across the U.S. to make this all happen. Our team has grown to over 90 different high school team members all across the U.S. We've been able to redistribute over 20,000 items in over 26 states and 14 different countries. What I was drawn to it was that it's a youth-led organization. We always have monthly meetings. Just hearing their great ideas is really great, and hopefully we can make those ideas come reality. The Shaw sisters of Second Serve have been an inspiration to me and also to our high school tennis team. It's a school of 91% economically disadvantaged kids. Having a tennis racket gives them that sense of ownership. 
At first, I couldn't really hit, but now I can do like everything. Now she's competing. She's our number one player. I have seen her build a sense of confidence. Nice job. Inspired to do more in their own backyard, the team started Serve Escondido. We provide free tennis lessons for under-resourced kids in our own hometown of San Diego. Good job. And in the spirit of giving back, we had a little surprise for Second Serve. Second Serve has done incredible work to make the game of tennis accessible to all. To help continue that work, Wilson is donating 100 tennis rackets and 50 pairs of youth sneakers to Second Serve. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's incredible. Oh. <laughs> Second Serve's mission of enhancing the lives of underserved children by fostering a love for tennis is inspirational and empowering to support that mission Athleta is donating 100 girls' tennis dresses to Second Serve. Thank you so oh much. My gosh. This is awesome. It's just really special to see that other people support this vision of greater access and greater diversity for all kids. When I'm on the tennis court, I've experienced that what you believe is really what you can achieve. When you're about to serve, when you're about to hit a ball, if you can visualize that ball going exactly to your target, that's often exactly what happens. Amazing sisters making a difference on and off the court. Next up, you've heard people say you can't choose your family. Well, maybe that's not entirely true. Meet a group within the LGBTQ plus community that's 32,000 family members strong and growing. And it all began with a TikTok video. Take a look. In 2018, I walked my own daughter down the aisle and just the thought of someone not having that parent at their wedding or in their life was just heartbreaking to me. That feeling motivated Dan Blevins to issue an invitation, not a dance challenge, in a TikTok video. If you are a same-sex couple that's getting married and you do not have biological parents there to support you, please let me know. What was your intended message for that? I was inspired by Sarah Cunningham and she's the founder of Free Mom Hugs. So I thought, I want to offer my services as a dad to do the same thing. There's parents that want to be there for you on your big day and will be your biggest fans. The idea, simple and straight from the heart. Dan, a hairdresser from Tennessee, offering to stand in as a dad for those in the LGBTQ plus community for weddings. I was able to walk my uh, daughter, my oldest girl down the aisle for her wedding. I, I don't think people realize until they're not there how important family is in those events. I think we tend to take our family for granted. Feeling that need of a mother figure or a father figure, even if it's virtually, means so much to a lot of people. The response immediate, the video going viral, and Dan, with the help of his friend Ray Otto, starting the group TikTok Stand In Families on Facebook. When Dan came to me with the idea, I was like, absolutely. We both knew it was needed in our community. Today, with over 32,000 members in over 60 countries, the group has become its own movement. Dan, who has kids of his own, has welcomed four more kids into his family. And Ray has added two nephews to hers. Last year, more than 80% of LGBTQ youth said COVID-19 made their living situations stressful, 42% seriously considering suicide. What would a group like this, what would it have meant to you when you came out? Oh, it would have meant a whole lot. I think I would have even been encouraged to come out sooner than 21. How come? Just to know that you have that support behind you and that, like, no matter who walks away from you, because I had a lot of people walk away from me when I came out. Dan's group turning strangers into family. Members setting extra seats at their Christmas dinner tables, sharing life advice, and providing a safe haven for those who may need it. Tracy Dealman found that support in Amy Brinsfield, who drove four hours to attend her wedding, even making the bouquet. I don't really have family except my sister. Amy was basically the only one that was like, if you don't mind, I can come up to the wedding. Being able to see them in person and give them a hug and be there to support them on their special day was just amazing for me. Beyond the big days, the effort grew to form support systems. They totally helped me find a safe way to medically start transitioning. Foster Joy, 
I think right now I have 15 bonus kids. Come be a part of mine. I got plenty of room. And rediscover what it means to be loved. She came for Christmas. She came to our wedding. She's basically a daughter to me. Uh, she calls me dad. Proof that family really is forever, no matter where you find them. It has changed my life. It's shown me that there's so much good in the world where I really hadn't seen that before. And as we said, that group continues to grow. Their ultimate goal, to create an app where members can easily and securely make these life-changing connections. After the break, the man turning people's personal moments into forever songs. Stay with us. Welcome back. Oh, how we love to dance on this show. And this next story features an award-winning dancer and choreographer bringing the past and present together while moving her art form into the future. Take a look. According to Latasha Barnes, it don't mean a thing if you ain't got that swing. When I'm dancing, I feel the music, I feel the space. And she's keeping jazz dance alive with what she calls the jazz continuum. I honestly feel my elders, my ancestors, all of that comes through in an instant. She's creative, she's innovative with it. It's like seeing past, present, and future. It's, it's life, you see life when she dances. Growing up in a multi-generational home in Virginia, she credits her great-grandmother with introducing her to the Lindy Hop. She just picked me up and started moving me around and she called it the swing. She just said, this is our fast dancing, that's how we did it. The Lindy Hop itself is the partnered expression of jazz dance, an African-American social dance, noted to have started in Harlem in uh, the 1920s. Within the Lindy Hop also are many, many individual jazz dance styles. Dances like the Charleston, the Breakaway, uh, Texas Tommy. Joining the military after high school, she rose the ranks and became a telecom and communication security specialist at the White House for the Obama administration. It was pretty amazing being a part of, of, of their, their White House um, experience. But it wasn't until a car accident in 2004 and the dance therapy that followed that Latasha started thinking about dance as a career. The focus on, on the muscle extension and contraction like really gave me back my dexterity. And yeah, that, that started the journey. A journey that led her to studying house and hip hop dance, eventually winning competitions. But she felt a desire to learn more. It really was the, the passing or the transitioning of my great grandmother that really pushed me to learning more about jazz. You know, she mentioned that she went up to New York to go dance at a fancy ballroom with some of her friends, the Savoy or somebody, something. It's like the Savoy ballroom. That's where you went. Known as the world's finest ballroom, the Savoy was a legendary Harlem dance hall that showcased some of the greatest jazz musicians of their time. Dancers from the Savoy were featured in films like Hell's a Poppin', which featured the Lindy Hop. Reconnecting with the Lindy Hop just led to this synergy with Bobby White, who was an international level instructor in, in Lindy Hop. We would spend hours and hours playing around with steps and dancing. It was through the course of that commitment that, you know, I, I went to the International Lindy Hop Championships. And from there, a scholarship brought Latasha to an unlikely place to further her studies. In the woods of Sweden, in a place called Hevang, 
was just still, still so confounding to me that I needed to go to Sweden to get this immersive experience in this inherently black dance. Seeing how many international celebrants there were of this tradition and culture really had me in a disjointed and discombobulated place. I felt like a guest in, in my own culture. And it was weird because if it had not been for what we understand now to be appropriation in some respects, that space would not have existed for me to even go and have that immersive experience. So I was really happy to be proven wrong <laughs> in, some of my, in some of the biases that I carried because of how they were wanting to uphold the dance, not just the art forms that they could make a profit from, that that wasn't their focus. Uh, because it's happening in the hip hop and house dance worlds also, and all of black dance forms, honestly. I fully recognize that there, there had to be another way to talk about this. That's where cultural surrogacy uh, came from for me. Yes, the Lendy Hub is for everyone. Always acknowledge and respect where it comes from. And in that same spirit, the dance aims to move forward in that way, to be a collective space for everyone to come to a place of understanding and celebration together. And by moving the Lindy Hop forward, its elders have put their trust in Latasha. Elders like Harlem historian Lana Turner. This incredible dance started right here. I know. I am calling you the tradition bearer. You actually have the ear and the minds of young people. You are able to bridge a number of forms of dance, as did the Lindy Hoppers at its time. As the assistant professor of dance at Arizona State University, Latasha now teaches a new generation of dancers. I'm so honored to be able to work with the youth there and to be a part of, of their journeys. You can learn dance anywhere nowadays. YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and you can research the history. This is connected to this step, which is connected to this music, which is connected to this community, which is connected to this step that preceded it, and so on and so forth. Latasha's mission of connecting dance and history continues through her work with the Black Lindy Hoppers Fund and the Jazz Continuum. Dance is in very good hand, especially with Latasha Barnes. Having first experienced this in my own family with my great grandmother, I, I just I know that she's intensely proud. I hope that all of my ancestors continue to be proud of, of the work that I'm doing in their name and in the name of our future ancestors. Next up, have you ever connected to the lyrics of a song as if it could have been written just for you? Well, what if your story could be turned into a song? Meet Mike Long, who's creating ballads for everyday people. NBC's Scotty Schwartz has this story. I think we know how this story begins. In a tiny basement studio in Portland, Oregon, there's something special about the lyrics floating in the air. They are still strangers at this point. This modern day bard is writing ballads about ordinary, everyday people. Tiny anthems is a system where you give me information about your sister or your husband. I will then compose a song. And it all started with an offer to write a song about anyone for two bucks and quickly snowballed into Mike Long's life's work. Today, Mike charges about $300 per song, putting more than 20 hours each into the composition. There's just like something absurd about what I'm doing that just makes me want to keep doing it. Devs of grain and crystal winds, it comes sailing in. He's now written and composed hundreds of tiny anthems, each created for an audience of one. I've never experienced a gift like that before. For Dev Sirk and Sid Snyder, Tiny Anthems has become the soundtrack of their lives. There are very few people in this world that have a love song written about them. That is so true, and we have three of them. And Mike's creative process can be as unpredictable as his lyrics. His orchestra, just about anything that makes a sound. And watching him create music from thin air is simply magical. Moments later, yet another sound ready to celebrate that indescribable essence that makes each one of us so unique. If you get close enough to a person, you'll find something to love about them. Gotti Schwartz, NBC News, Portland, Oregon. We're back with more stories to leave you feeling good after the break.
Welcome back to The Boost. It's been said that a little kindness can go a long way. So Hoda and Jenna decided to spread some around New York with small acts in hopes of making a big difference. Today is gonna be an awesome day. I can't wait. We have a plan. Okay, what is it? Our plan is we are going to go up to random New Yorkers and show them random acts of kindness. I can't wait. Anybody, Let's we'll just walk do it. up. Hug strangers. They may not like it, but we're in. Who cares? Let's That's go. This is up. It's dawn in New York City, and trepid New Yorkers are heading to work. It's time to spread the love. New Yorkers love their coffee, and we're going to provide as many as possible. Free cups! First stop, Xenon's Coffee Cart on 6th Avenue. Okay, what do you want? Large. Large? No sugar, How please? much is it? 150 Not today! Right. Awesome. What do you get every morning? A muffin. Today it's free! Come on up! Are you Some wondering toast? why we're doing this? I'm on the show. No, we're just a random act. Can we put a smile on your face? Yeah, that's what we were hoping to do. <laughs> After caffeinating most of Midtown, we head east. We're gonna pay for some people's commutes to work. Yes, we got, look how many, look. Bye. Here you go. Bye. Enjoy the bus ride. Bye. Enjoy your Bye. commute. Bye. Round trip ticket. Bye. Have a good day at work. Okay. Bye, baby. Hey! Do you want a free ride home right from here. work? Awesome. Happy Bye. day! Bye. Bye. I just moved here to New York. You did? did yeah. You, this, by the way, this is what happens every single day in New York. <laughs> so anyway, I'm nice blown people. away. You New Yorkers are way nicer than in San Francisco. Right? So. Well, uh, I don't know that, but there's nice people everywhere. Bring it on. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Hi. Don't Thank you sure. love a free Thank trip? You. Have a good day. Spread kindness. Who nice needs a round trip? Happy day. Have a wonderful one. Lean in. Bye, everybody. It's time to head north to Our Lady Queen of Angels School in Harlem. Here we are. Our kindness tour has brought us here. Next stop, some cute kids. Come on. We're, We're here. here. Go cry. Hi. Hi. Hi, guys. Hello. Who likes to read? Raise your hand if you like to read. Who wants their own cool book? Oh. Who wants to be happy? Because I'm happy. Happy to take home a book of their very own. Thank you, sweet oh, girl. Oh, you made my oh, day. What is happening? Let's get, get, group hug. Hug. get over here. Group get hug. over here. This is the biggest hug oh. we've ever had. Oh. Say cheddar cheese. Cheddar cheese. The biggest hugs, the sweetest smiles from new friends. Finally, New York Presbyterian Hospital. This could be my favorite part of the day. Oh. We're going to go and give thanks to some people who do some really great work. Can't wait. I can't either. Lunch is set up in a secret location as nurses in the pediatric unit gather for what they think is a staff meeting. Hi! Hi! Hi. Hi. Oh my god! Hi! Hi. 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 <laughs> Jenna and I wanted to come and say thank you thank because you guys, so you guys work so hard all the time. And so for the nurses here today, there is such a thing as a free lunch. That's we wish good. it was, you get a car, you get a car. You <laughs> but instead, you get a sandwich, you, you get, get a sandwich. sandwich. Thank y'all for everything you did. I just can't believe how nice it is. Oh. Oh. I'm gonna do the biggest selfie you've ever yeah. seen. Okay. As if our day couldn't get any better, just as we were leaving. Do we have good news? In walks 18-year-old patient Gianluca Morola. I'm cancer free. Yeah! <laughs> Mom, the only person who's probably happier, happier than him is, is you. Oh, I'm happy for your family. Love wow. y'all. He couldn't wait to share his surprise with the nurses he says were like family. Oh, you didn't hear that? It's amazing. It is without a doubt the most precious gift of all. Even a small act of kindness can make someone's day. So let's all try to do something kind today. And our next story, Patricia Gallagher. She also is known as the flower lady and she is doing just that. She's spreading the love one bouquet at a time. On any given day, 68-year-old Patricia Gallagher's car will have many additional passengers. While this may not get her in the HOV lane, it does bring smiles to everyone she meets. Since 2013, Patricia has been collecting discarded flowers and delivering them to deserving people. Hi, I'm Patricia. I'm the flower lady. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. 
This started when my daughter gave me the idea. She explained to me that grocery stores, flowers, funeral homes have flowers that they would normally just throw away at the end of the day. And if someone comes along and they ask if they can rescue them, the stores are more than willing to give the flowers because the stores won't have to pay a company to take the waste away. Well, every flower should have a second chance to make someone happy. Oh, hi, this is Patricia Gallagher with the Happy Flower Day Project. I'm here to pick up the flower shares. And with that, Patricia created the Happy Flower Day Project. Happy Flower Day. I do the Happy Flower Day Project about five days a week. Even in the mornings, the store might say, I only have 13 flowers for you. I just sort of hear a little message in my ear. Yeah, Trish, there may only be 13 flowers. Think of the 13 people that you're going to surprise this morning. I do ask God, where should I take these flowers today? That's really my personal flowery GPS. On most days, my little white car is filled. And on the days that I can't fit the flowers in, I just say to myself, okay, this is trip number one. I can easily drive 150 miles because I just can't bear to waste a flower. When I started this project, my car was brand new. It probably had 10 miles on it. Now it has 168,000 miles. We're going to need one more car. One more car. <laughs> okay. Woo. Look at this, all these petals. It looks like a wedding. Seeing Trish come in and, and brighten their day really makes them feel like people care, that people uh, haven't forgotten about them, and it just really helps them throughout their day and throughout their stay here. Hi, Eileen. Hi, Hi Matt. Hi, Hannah. The flower ladies here. Oh, yeah, flowers do brighten my day. Yes, there's nothing more than the smell of the wet, smell of the flowers and the colors of them. It's tremendous. This is a good world. It's like we're not strangers. Everybody is a friend when you're giving them flowers. Speedy delivery. Look at the faces of the residents. I mean, you can't help but smile when you see flowers. They're just so beautiful. Thank you so much. We have a birthday girl over here. Birthday. They speak a universal language of caring. It's not oh, been a good day. It's so. not a good day. Well, this is, this is just what I needed. Thank you so much. Oh, you'll be in my thoughts and prayers. <laughs> I'm a guest. It means so much. You just never know what a person's going through. Trisha, I want you to know that I truly appreciate what you do, and this was a big deal for me today. Thank you. Okay, have a good day. I hope there's a ton of copycats and I hope that she really brings awareness to things that are so simple yet so meaningful. My hopes for tomorrow is that I always remain healthy and energetic with a free spirit and that I can continue doing these flowers for the rest of my life. What a creative way to spread kindness and make someone smile. And we hope our final video will leave you with a smile. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Boost. We have one final video for you today, sure to bring a smile to your face. 
A four-year-old boy named Sawyer has a genetic disorder. It causes hearing loss in children, but he recently underwent a cochlear implant surgery, and the cameras were rolling when he got to hear his family's voices for the very first time. Take a look. Okay, now I'm turning it off. Hi. <laughs> Hi! Can you hear? I love you. What do you think? Oh, yeah. I love you. Oh, sweetie, he just lights up. Parents, great. siblings, everybody there. She says that is the biggest Mama. smile. Mom says the Daddy. biggest smile she's ever seen. Way to go, Sawyer. Can you imagine me, that mother, and hearing that? Yeah. Oh. Time. Oh, that beautiful. was a good yeah. one. What a perfect way to wrap up our show. Thanks so much for joining us. And remember to spread some kindness and positivity today. Hello, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Consumer Confidential. I'm Vicki Nguyen. For the next half hour, we're helping to make your life a little easier, from social media hacks to save money to keeping your kitchen clean. But first, a focus on real estate. Despite rising interest rates, now may be a time to consider a fixer-upper. But before you say yes, here's what to consider to avoid ending up in a money pit. I'm a millennial who's finally ready to buy a house, but feeling very discouraged about the current market situation. Frustrated would-be home buyers taken to social media. The market is absolutely insane. In total, I saw about 10 houses over the course of two weeks. A combination of high interest rates and low inventory are leaving many would-be buyers on the outside looking in. Last year, home prices hit a record high, and the National Association of Realtors estimates the median home price will go up again this year to $386,000. But real estate experts say home buyers may find more bang for their buck with a fixer-upper. I'm starting to see house prices decrease specifically in the houses that are fixer-upper. Ethan Shin is a real estate windows. agent in Florida. In South Florida right now, we're seeing turnkey homes that are a million plus and this house that we're standing in right now, Vicki, it's half the price of that. I joined Shin and his client Joe Donovic as they looked at fixer-uppers near West Palm Beach, Florida. Joe's budget, $450,000, plus an extra $100,000 for repairs. You ready to go take a look? Certainly am. First, this three-bedroom home. Despite some cosmetic issues, older appliances, and interesting wallpaper, it's in pretty good shape, except for one big potential expense. The windows, we get big hurricanes in Florida, so replacing these windows with complete impact windows is vital for up to code, and that can leave you spending an extra 50 to 70 grand on impact windows for the whole house. The asking price, $490,000. Next, this three-bedroom home in a popular neighborhood. Come on, guys, after you. Oh, wow. It needs a lot of work. This is definitely rough compared to the last one. I mean, I really don't think that I could work with most of that kitchen, or at least it would be a really big project for me to undertake. All of these floorboards aren't even put together, and then if you see in this closet as well, there's also a discoloration. Lots of things can be fixed up inside of a house, but this one I noticed, there's a busy road right out over the backyard wall. We know that you can't change the location of the house, so having a busy road right in your backyard over the wall is not something that a buyer may want. Even so, the house is listed for 525000 Finally, this four-bedroom home. Joe, first impression? Yeah, so I love the Toronto floors. That is something that I'm actually after. And the fact that there's a lot of light from the sunroom, I can see that being a perfect office for me. But the floors may need to be refinished, and the backyard has seen better days. I see here that it says I can't use the sink. Yes, the agent did disclose to me that there is an active leak in the vanity. The asking price, 469000 Welcome back to Moonlight Manor. Michelle Bauer started renovating homes as a hobby during the pandemic and documents her projects on social media. What should home buyers look for? We always look for stains in the ceiling. If you can access the attic or any crawl space up above there, look to make sure there's nothing wet up there, signs of mold. She says water damage is a big red flag. The roof needs repairs or replacing. That can be a $100,000 fix. She also says shop for salvaged or secondhand items. Try to reuse materials from the home itself. And when it comes to lumber, you can look for local lumber yards, old sawmills, which is what we go to a lot. Lumber's cheaper. It's usually old growth lumber. Finally, expect the unexpected. I would build in a 20 percent, 25 percent 
additional amount of money just for the things that pop up along the way. Because they always do. Yes, they always do. <laughs> Michelle also says know your limitations. If you can't do it yourself, find a licensed contractor and talk to their references. Also, try to go see their previous work in person if possible. And when you are getting those quotes, don't always choose the cheapest one. Look for the most reliable contractor you can find. Now to one of the most important places in your home, the kitchen. We all do our best to keep it clean, but there may be germs lurking in places you would not expect. Take a look. This is the top dirtiest item in the kitchen, the spices. You would be surprised. In fact, the researchers at the USDA were shocked when they found this out. Here's what they did. They took 371 people and said, hey, could you make some turkey burgers with seasoning for us and a salad? And everybody thought they were trying out new recipes. No, what they were doing was observing how oh. these people cook in the kitchen. And it ended up when they tested the surfaces more than half of the time, these spice uh, jars had the most contamination. Because you're touching bacteria. your stuff and then touching the spice jar. It's sprinkling. literally a worst case scenario because you're handling the meat, you're forming the patties, and yes. then you're like, oh, got to add the onion powder, the salt, the pepper. Yes. And you don't think, let me go back and wipe those down. And sometimes people aren't washing their hands during mm. meal prep between each thing. Okay. So in your cooking show, you would do the mise en place, <laughs> right? Cooking show. You would yes. actually put the well, ingredients out. And, and yes, Tone and I were just talking about, like, yeah. I like to put it out because otherwise I obsessively check the recipe 500 yeah, times, <laughs> like, at, per minute. So I just try to put it all in the thing, and then I don't have to check again how much it's I need. It's a out. smart thing to do okay. to avoid cross-contamination as okay. well. And if you're worried about it, look, Pathogens don't live very long on surfaces. Just give these a wash in hot them. soapy water or okay. wipe down. Okay, speaking of soap, soap and water, this, I would imagine, was one of the cleanest places, but actually the sink is one of the germiest? Yes, so you okay. look at the sink, the handle, and the soap dispenser. Okay, what do so you think is the germiest, Hoda? Probably the sink. So according to this yeah. study, it was the soap dispenser. And here's why. Your hands are gross. That's when you touch the soap, oh. and then you wash them. So that so makes this, sense, So this, the outside right? stays yucky. Exactly. So if you're worried about that, look, just wash that Wipe when that you down. wash your hands every yeah. once in a while. Yes, the faucet and the sink. They say to clean out your entire sink every night. If you're a big meal prepper, look, you're putting eggs in there, poultry, meats. You're going to want to wash that with hot soapy with? water. You can also use a mix of bleach, one to two oh, tablespoons okay. of bleach per gallon of water. That's another great disinfectant. Okay. And, of course, the regular ones that are on the market. Yeah, things you don't think you need to clean, but you right, definitely, but you definitely do. do. Okay. The thing we use to clean is sponges. It's pretty grim. Okay, so we <laughs> know about grim. sponges. Sponges, they're wet mm -hmm. and they're cold and they're a place where bacteria love to live. So the USDA actually says you can microwave your sponge one mm -hmm. to two minutes. That'll kill off most things. Some people recommend throwing it in the dishwasher. I would just say make sure your dishwasher has a really strong drying cycle because the key here is to keep everything dry. Right. When it comes to your dish cloths, yep. a good best practice they say to swap them out every day. I feel mm -hmm. like that's a lot of laundry. If that's not realistic for you, at least make sure you're hanging up your dishcloth in a place where it's going to be fully getting dry. Because again, you want to avoid moisture. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's nice is having a different, um, we do this in our house. We have hand cloths for drying our hands. Right. We have a different cloth that you use for drying the dishes. Mm -hmm. And then we have another cloth for cleaning the counters. Yeah. So that wow. helps keep everything separate. Hmm. That's a lot of dishes. This How is, this is a, oh, go ahead. No, how often should you replace those sponges? Because I feel like ours hang around forever and yeah. ever. I know. So the rule of thumb is, look, yeah. if it's getting dingy, like yeah. it's falling apart, tattered, that's like it's far yeah. too gone if yeah. it starts to smell bad. Yeah. But it really depends. Some people aren't really in their kitchen that yeah. much. So one sponge could right. last them a month. For yeah. someone else, it's a week. <laughs> okay. yeah. Vic, let's talk about these cutting boards here. They're on the list as well. Why yeah. is that? All right. So whether it's plastic or wood, Craig, when you are cutting in a cutting board, those grooves become a breeding ground for bacteria. They love to live the in the little nooks and yeah, and the grooves that are made by your knife. Oh. So the best practice here is actually double washing your cutting board, meaning you wash it with the soap and sponge, uh -huh. the hot water, then you throw it in the dishwasher. Oh. That's the recommendation. The number one thing to do as well, make sure they are dry before you put them away. You don't want to be putting away a damp cutting board, especially not a wooden mm. one. And then finally, a different one for your meat for mm. your poultry, for your fruits and vegetables. That is the, the key to preventing cross-contamination. Do the plastic germ, do the plastic cutting boards carry as many germs as the wooden ones? They say in the cuts of the grooves, it really doesn't make a big difference. Okay. So right. yeah, don't don't have a false sense of security with plastic. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, Vic, in about 30 seconds here, give okay. me, we got a produce drawer, we got yeah. a meat drawer from the fridge. You guys have a well-stocked fridge, because I know Siri cooks. Yeah. A great thing to do is line the refrigerator doors with paper towels to catch all the juice and the drippings, mm -hmm. and it's easy to take that out and throw it away. Mm -hmm. Real simple, cleaning experts say, 
clean out your entire fridge once every season. Mm -hmm. And you can seriously just wash these with soap and water or use a wipe across the inside or give them a good spray. Again, let them dry. Follow the directions to make sure that all the bacteria is dead. Okay, and what are the shrimp and what are these doing? Oh, okay, so you definitely <laughs> want to put any of your raw meat right into the produce bag before you put it in. Extra layer of extra protection extra. when exactly. you put it in. Exactly, so you okay. don't get all the Those have been out a while, I might not eat those. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure to properly clean those areas and items to prevent cross-contamination and harmful bacteria. Up next, what you need to know before buying a car in 2023. And are you thinking about going electric? There are things to consider before making that switch. That's all ahead on Consumer Confidential. We'll be right back. We are back with Consumer Confidential. After two years of surging prices, car buyers are hoping to finally get back in the driver's seat this year. But while the market for used cars is softening, new vehicles are setting records with sky-high prices. Here's NBC's Sam Brock with more. For drivers who've braved pandemic sticker shock, the road to buying a car hasn't just been bumpy. It's been a financial sinkhole. We couldn't really find anything brand new. And, to, and the used cars were the prices of what we thought the brand new cars were going to be priced for. Brittany Alexander and Candon Rodriguez, just two of the car shoppers who bought or leased in the last year. Though they were still stunned to learn the average price tag for a new vehicle. In December, a staggering $49,507. When I told you $50,000, your reaction is what? That's terrible. <laughs> that is. No, because like a lot of people don't make that annually. So how can you afford to buy a car if you don't have that money? In addition to soaring rents and inflated grocery bills, cars have also been pinching consumer wallets with some of the underlying issues like supply chain disruptions, lack of semiconductors and labor shortages still a problem, but stabilizing. I would say the situation has improved significantly on all three of those fronts, but there are still some constraints in the supply, so we're not completely out of the woods. As vehicle supplies tick back up, you'll notice that there's a better selection of certain kinds of cars, the ones that turn a higher profit margin. You're still seeing automakers um, putting constrained components in high value cars. So the most profitable cars are the ones that they're willing to build. So pickups and SUVs are becoming more, you know, more available. This in turn has revved up the average cost of vehicles dramatically. But check out this split. While year over year inflation for new cars rose 6.2% in December, it plummeted 8.8% for used cars and trucks, a significant reversal. Carvana, the second largest used car retailer in the country, is expanding its signature car vending machines from 33 to 37 in the coming months, including the newest one in Denver. The company is optimistic about the new year and banking on a boost from tax season. Still, even with used car costs coming down, the industry-wide jolt has left many shoppers, like Miami lawyer Brooks LaRue, out of options. I don't see how anyone could afford a car right now, new or used, without going into significant debt. Thank you, Sam. Well, given the unpredictability of gas prices, there has been growing interest in electric vehicles with a record number sold just last year. But will making the switch from gas to an electric powered vehicle really save you money? Here's what you need to know before making the switch. We aren't flying high Jetson style. 
But the future of cars and trucks is here, with many automakers electrifying their lineups. The all-new, all-electric EQS SUV. Some, like Cadillac, vowing to go all-electric by 2030 and Lexus by 2035, fueled in part by consumer demand to go green and ditch unpredictable fuel prices. A recent survey revealing more than a third of Americans would consider buying or leasing an EV when in the market for a new ride. But right now, it's tough finding cars, especially electric ones. Why is it so hard to get your hands on an electric vehicle? There's difficulty in the industry building vehicles in general, and EVs being the newest thing on the block with the latest technology are just more difficult to build, and ultimately the supply is just not there. Alex Nizek is an automotive engineer at Consumer Reports. When it comes to price, you may experience a little sticker shock. On average, a new EV now costs around $64,000, nearly $16,000 more than the overall industry average. If you compare similar models, a new gas-powered Hyundai Kona costs around $22,000. The electric version, nearly $34,000. But shifting gears from gas to electric can help you save money down the road when it comes to gas and maintenance. A Consumer Reports study found a typical EV owner who mostly charges at home can save up to $1,000 a year on fueling costs, with gas now at more than $3 a gallon. And Nizek says EVs usually spend less time in the shop, saving owners about $4,600 in maintenance and repair fees over the car's lifetime when compared to gas-powered vehicles. The reason for that is EVs tend to have less moving parts. And Nizek says electric vehicles usually require fewer routine checkups. A quick look under the hood, you can see it's usually a storage space. There's no need to replace oil filters or parts like spark plugs. What questions should you ask yourself before you buy an EV? It depends on how you drive and where you drive. If you're taking a lot of road trips and you're going to have to rely on the public charging uh, infrastructure and you're going to be waiting longer and taking more stops to charge the vehicle. When planning a long road trip, remember most EVs have a driving range of a little more than 200 miles. And when using a public fast charger, it can take 25 to 60 minutes to juice up. While California and New York have the most charging stations by volume, Vermont has the most per capita. And by 2030, the federal government plans to build a national network of 500,000 EV chargers. Nizek says if you mostly take short trips, running errands or carpooling, look for charging options around town, at work, and especially at home. You can get a basic charging outlet installed in your own garage. Just make sure you hire a licensed electrician. Costs vary, but start around 200 bucks. Depending on where you live, electricity could cost more than gas, and cold weather or extreme heat can drastically reduce an EV's range. Nizek urges consumers to also consider reliability. As more EVs roll out, Nizek says if you can wait, avoid buying first-year models. Allow some time for manufacturers to work out the kinks. All tips to make your next ride a smooth one. While EVs cost more on average, under the Inflation Reduction Act, you can receive a federal tax credit up to $7,500 when buying a new EV or $4,000 for a used one. Coming up, it's become a hot target for thieves. Catalytic converters. Learn how to make it harder for crooks to steal yours. Plus, a breakdown of some of the best money-saving hacks that are currently dominating social media. We're back right after this.
Welcome back. It is a device found in almost every car and it has become one of the hottest items for thieves. It's called the catalytic converter and once it's gone, your car makes a ton of noise and really can't run. Replacing that catalytic converter can cost thousands, but there are some simple things you can do to prevent this kind of theft from happening to you. Across the country, thieves caught on camera. Brazen thefts of catalytic converters in broad daylight. In November, a federal takedown of a criminal network dealing in stolen catalytic converters, 21 arrests across the U.S., and $545 million in assets seized, including homes, cash, and luxury vehicles. What makes converters so hot? They contain precious metals like rhodium, palladium, and platinum. Right now, rhodium alone valued at more than $12,000 per ounce, and it's consumers who pay the price. It can cost anywhere from two to five thousand dollars to have a mechanic replace your catalytic converter. So what can you do to protect this very valuable part of your car? With me now is Sergeant Justin Mount of the Orlando Police Department. Thank you so much. So first, let me ask you, how easy is it for them to get under and steal one of these? It's very simple, Vicki. Basically, all they do is they just make a couple cuts, remove the O2 sensor, and they're gone in 60 seconds or less. Under a minute? Under a minute. What are some things consumers can do to protect their catalytic converters? Well, here's an option for people. It's a shield, and oh, wow. essentially it just goes and bolts right up to basically block the catalytic converter, okay. and uh, you can have your mechanic install it. There's smaller ones that they make, you know, cages that just protect around the catalytic converter, and it's not necessarily going to stop them from stealing it. It just might make it harder and be more of that deterrent that uh, makes them move on to the next vehicle. Shields can cost anywhere from two to six hundred dollars. Sergeant Mount also recommends having a mechanic engrave the VIN or vehicle identification number on the catalytic converter and coat it with a bright high temperature paint. One can cost less than 15 bucks. Some police departments also offer kits like this to etch a unique code registered to your car's VIN. Police in Orlando investigating a growing number of cases, more than 300 in 2022. That's up 618 percent from two years ago. Nationally, cases up 1,215 percent. They come in from out of town. Yeah. They'll come in for a weekend, they'll hit us hard, and they're gone. Sergeant Mount says when parking at a hotel or mall, choose interior spots to make it harder for thieves to get under your car. And pay attention if you see anyone walking around with a cordless saw. Right then and there, that should tell you, like, something is not right. Mm -hmm. And go ahead, call 911. Get a good description, whether it's the vehicle or a tag. And when you're home... The idea is to park in your garage if you can, but what if you've got to park in a driveway or on the street? What should you be thinking about? Lighting is huge. The better lit the driveway is, the better you're going to be as far sure. as deterring criminals. Spotlights are also very good. What about security cameras? They're relatively inexpensive now. The ones that they have are battery operated and they have good quality video. So they're, they're very helpful when it comes to evidence that we can use to solve these crimes. When you have all this stuff installed, is that also potentially a deterrent to the thieves? Yes, these guys are going to see that and they'll move on to the next. These crimes can be hard to solve. Sergeant Mount says spread the word by sharing pictures, security camera video and details about any thefts with your neighborhood group or websites like Nextdoor. People can help you gather the clues yes. by getting descriptions, license plates. That's where it starts. If we have that as a lead, man, that goes a long way. If your converter is stolen, you should call your insurance company to see if they will cover the replacement. Not everyone has the proper coverage, though, so it is a good idea to double check right now what kind of insurance coverage you have before something like this happens to you. Up next, the money-saving tips dominating social media right now.
Social media is filled with videos of people coming up with creative ways to spend less and save more. NBC's business reporter Brian Chung recently spoke to our friends on the third hour of today and broke down some of the most popular hacks. First of all, why are social media users especially like so interested in these these finance hacks? Yeah, well, I mean, right now, look, inflation is high. People are concerned about what the economic outlook is going to look like this year. So people are saying, I got to try and be more mindful about my saving and also my spending. But then also interest rates are going to go up. Okay. The expectation is tomorrow the Federal Reserve will continue to raise interest rates. That means your credit card rates are going to remain high. Your mortgage rates are going to remain high. So all these things are making people more mindful. They're taking to TikTok. They're taking to Instagram. Yeah. It's popping off with a lot of these types of trends. So how are they trying to gamify spending specifically? Yeah, well, gamifying, trying to make it more engaging. And, and one thing that you can kind of take a look at as an example is the no spend challenge. Essentially what you do is you print out a calendar and then you look at your spending. So the days where you uh, don't spend on things that you don't need, that extra sweatshirt that you just didn't need to have, uh, you're going to color that in, in green. But the days that you mm. do spend on things that you don't need, you're going to highlight that in red. That's totally okay. Right. But the idea is just to highlight your wins, make sure that you're building good habits and aware of the days when you're spending on things that you don't need. And by the way, if you put gas into your car yeah. to get to work, that, that doesn't count. That's yeah, something that you need. What great. about these exactly. apps? Yeah. So you use apps to help? Yeah, there are apps like uh, You Need a Budget okay. and Mint if you don't want to print out an actual calendar. A lot of people don't have printers, so you can use digital versions as well. Okay. That's I a think, great idea. I do think it's fun to make it fun. Yeah, it's a competition you know, I, in a way. It, it, it is, yeah. of course. And I love uh, this whole envelope idea as a way to save money. Yeah, so this is really great. It's called the Envelope Savings Challenge, and I think we've got the props actually yes. right here. So essentially what you do is you're going to take 100 envelopes, and you're going to number them 1 to 100, mm -hmm. and then you're going to just draw one every single day okay. right, at random. So let's say, for example, I pulled up a 69 out here, <laughs> and then what you're going to do is you're going to take uh, some hard cash, which I happen to have in my pocket right Very here, nice. and then you're going to basically say, all right, I'm going to put $69 into this envelope, okay. and then you put it away. Oh. And essentially what you're doing is that you're accumulating that savings over time, and 100 envelopes it's going to get you $5,000. In dollars in a hundred days. It's a substantial amount Just of money. Just by pulling in. Yep, exactly. And in. by the way, Some days are easy. You can scale this down too. Mm -hmm. So if you only can do, let's say, for example, That's 50 really days, well, okay. then that'll accumulate about $1,275. If I did the math right, 25 would be $325. Oh, now you're so just showing up. I'm just, you know, look, I'm the data reporter after Oh, all, look right? at me. I so, can crunch numbers. <laughs> hey, I'm killing it. You know? All right. No, this so, is a really great idea. So, Brian, how do you combine all these ideas to actually you know, put this together and make this part of your life. Yeah, well, it's important to remember that savings is one part of it mm -hmm. and then spending is the other part of it, right? So if you've got a few spare envelopes like I have right here, mm -hmm. you can do a zero budgeting challenge. You mm -hmm. can basically put a category like, oh, <laughs> moving over this way. Uh, you can do, for example, groceries for $200, right? You can also say, well, for the internet bill, I'm going to put $80 in, right? You're going to break the cash into these categories or, for example, glasses for Chanel, right? You can uh -huh. say, all right, I'm going <laughs> to save up with these envelopes. But once you put the money in there and then once it's gone, it's gone. And the idea here is to curb overspending. So for your boy, for example, right, sneakers, right. $200, right? I buy too much when sure. it comes to sneakers, mm -hmm. right? Once I've spent through this, that's it for the month. It's a mm -hmm. way to police and make sure that you're just kind of mindful of how much that. How much are those cost? These are about $200. <laughs> okay, there you go. All right. So I burn through the month. There I'm done. Yeah. All right, why don't you go over to Mr. Magoo All right. here? So we have Mr. Magoo. <laughs> we have about one minute left. This is yeah. big. All over TikTok now, people are talking about side hustles. I saw one yesterday, and I'm like, maybe I should sell T-shirts. Um, <laughs> Because <laughs> they make it seem like it's so simple. Hey, extra money is money, yeah. right? I mean, I think what, what was Drake said that the as long as the outcome is income. So did I you think just quote Drake. I did just okay. quote Drake. Impressive. But look, all this is about high inflation right now. People are looking for ways to get extra money. Yeah. We've seen a lot of trends on TikTok. I've seen people set up vending machines. Yeah. I saw someone set up an inflatable nightclub in their backyard. Wow. They charge entry to get inside the nightclub. Wow. People would do it. People would do it. But yeah. the important thing here, that's the nightclub right there. Wow. Oh Look goodness. how impressive that is. But that is expensive. I looked it up, folks, right? Yeah. Don't invest more than you can lose in these side hustles. That it's is cost important. You. Yes. Why would you take on more debt yep. if you're trying to pay off debt? And also finally. set boundaries. Even if the money works out, time is money. It takes time to that's set up good. these side hustles. Thanks, Brian. And that is our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Nguyen. Good morning. Welcome to today. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We need to pull up one extra chair at the table. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours.
In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William Franz Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960, or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists, and Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Ducky Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eatery is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Ducky Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duck Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Ducky Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po'boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase, Jr. and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Dookie Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china. She wanted linens. She wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African-American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace but that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had 
the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall, the list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chase's when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time, they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades, from red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Dukey. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. Gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter 4. Being a fourth generation African American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy, best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. We are enjoying everything. everything. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase, Chase to, to get, get myself my... some gumbo. When, when the service, service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together.
A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's Restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X according to Professor Psyche williams Forson, The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's. Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzy Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events, just four years apart, sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open, nothing was open, you know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken.
Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. it's, it's so, so good, good to, to see, see you. It's been, so long. it's been way too long. I missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, my baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's had. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, so we used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. Now is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, yeah. See how gently he's putting it in there. Putting the baby to bed. Yep. They'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like, I feel her. I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. You gotta <laughs> pick, up your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow. That looks perfect. Now this now is you're what, a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what you're person. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning is moist, crisp. Oh. Your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this piece to go. Oh, I'm going to pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I could come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and uh, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab, you know, once it became popularized, but in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ain't here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activists Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and uh, Huey P. Newton come to the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward, but how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. Say cheesecake. Cheesecake. <laughs> As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. Hello and welcome to The Boost. I'm Chanel Jones in for Hoda. We are here to start your day with a little bit of joy and no one sparks joy like Maria Shriver. She recently sat down with author, producer and actor Roma Downey for a conversation that will inspire and encourage all of us every step of the way. Take a look. That doesn't belong to you. From her nine seasons on TV's Touched by an Angel. Sent by God. It has begun to her faith-positive miniseries and best-selling devotional books, Roma Downey has made it her mission to spread kindness and hope through the Word of God. Now in her new book, Be an Angel, she shares how to do just that, using favorite quotes and scriptures along with her own personal stories of discovery and growth. You actually believe that all of us can actually be angels. What do you mean by that? It's one thing to say, I love you, or I believe in God, and it's a whole other thing to actually take an action around that. So be an angel really is a call to action, to be kind. She says this starts with how we begin our day. In the morning, I start my day in gratitude. Whether you believe in God or you don't, to think about maybe how could I do something for somebody else today? Think of people can do that, that maybe they would feel more hopeful, that maybe they would feel more connected. Do you think the idea of telling people they can be an angel will turn people off? That's a religious thing and uh, I don't see myself that way. I think that we're all a little bit broken, aren't we? You know, we, nobody is perfect. Um, this is not about being perfect. This is really just about being kind. Yeah. Here at her home outside Los Angeles, Roma says life is a far cry from her childhood growing up in war-torn Ireland, where she first learned the power of kindness from her father. We're so divided in the United States, yes. for example. What did he convey to you that helped you not become a person of hate? You know, the minute you see somebody as different than you, 
it's I think it's easier to feel that disconnection or so mm. our dad would encourage us just to find the things that we shared the similarities in each other so in a way you're doing the same work as your father I guess so. did yeah I never on thought a, of it on a I never thought of it that way and through a book yeah I suppose so in some ways you know maybe we just turn into our parents before <laughs> we realize it in her book, Roma also shares lessons from her 15-year marriage to Hollywood producer Mark Burnett. And she talks about the value of getting older as a woman in her 60s. I'm quicker to say, I don't really want to do that to things that I don't really want to do. Right. I realize a lot of my life I was like a, much more of a people pleaser. Age you know, has given you the right to say no to yeah, things. I think so. I don't know about you or anybody watching, but I'm a menopausal woman, and sleep and I are not the best of friends anymore. And so some nights I'm lying in my bed, you know, and the things that maybe were like little worries during the day mm -hmm. become these Herculean things to wrestle with in the night. Anybody that follows me on social media knows I'm obsessed with the sunrise. It's a great sort of symbolism of a new day, a new beginning. And if you messed up yesterday, let's try and do better today. Next up, meet Stephanie, the 2023 New York City Youth Poet Laureate. I sat down with Stephanie to discuss where she finds her inspiration and what she hopes to pass on to the next generation. This is the year that every black girl on the block lets their hair out to speak with the sun and the concrete sings a gospel tune with two swinging ropes on beat. On the streets of the South Bronx, 18-year-old Stephanie Pacheco can easily find poetry. So has your family always lived in the Bronx? Yeah, for, for decades and decades and decades and decades. <laughs> This place is very sacred for me. So tell us where we are now. We are currently in the Grand Concourse Library. This library is very special to me because it's, it's where I grew up. <laughs> but you have to come once in a while. Yeah, you know, I will, I will. This library is where she wrote the poem that crowned her New York City's Youth Poet Laureate. This year is 2023 Youth Poet Laureate. It is Stephanie. <laughs> The competition is a local branch of the National Youth Poet Laureate that made Amanda Gorman a household name. In collaboration with the Urban Word Program, it awards young writers and leaders who are committed to honing their craft and creating change in their communities. What went through your mind when you heard, you know what, congratulations, this is your title? My gosh, I think I still haven't processed the moment. I was just so excited to like be a part of this legacy and be a part of this community of poets. The winning poem called On Surviving House Fires pays homage to her hometown. Tell them how they set our neighborhood on fire and tried to turn us into ash. Then tell them how we coughed through the smoke anyway and survived. What do you want people to take away from that specific poem? It's important to acknowledge trauma and hurt and, and, and violence. And it's also important to acknowledge joy and survival and all the beautiful things that we are because we carry more than just grief. Stephanie started performing poetry only three years ago, inspired by her advocacy work in high school. We have done this before, turned ruin into rhythm. It, it was something about poetry and the delivery of the poet that spoke to people and spoke life into people like nothing else could, it seemed. The issue she cares about most, educational inequity and community access. Funds is something that I worry about and keeping our libraries open, our community centers open and our schools funded. There are people who say these same things, but they're not living it. And mm -hmm. it's very clear to me, you've lived it. Yeah, advocacy and activism is, is life's work. We free ourselves. It's work she continues to do and hopes to pass on to the next generation. I want young people who resonate with me and my story and my identity to look at me and know that there is no limit. When you say your story, what's your story? She grew up in the Bronx, wasn't given much, didn't have much, but made something anyway. 
So may all of our forgotten people know abundance and may every disempowered soul with wrists all bruised and blistered claim their existence to be righteous and take their freedom into their own hands. Coming up, the inspiring mom behind NBA superstar, Jason Tatum. Stay with us. Welcome back. The Boston Celtics' Jason Tatum was named MVP of the All-Star Game over the weekend. And tonight, he'll be front and center as the regular season resumes. And his number one fan, mom, Brandi Cole Barnes, will be cheering him on. I had the pleasure of talking with Brandi for our series Through Mom's Eyes and got the details on how she raised an NBA superstar. What was Jason like as a child? Very quiet, very observant, but he's always loved basketball. Motherhood isn't easy for anybody, but when you're 18 or 19 years old, what do you remember about those early days? I literally had him on spring break, and I went back and uh, took midterms the next week. When I got pregnant, everybody wrote me off. People were just like, you know, you're never going to amount to what you, you were supposed to. You're just going to be another statistic. And that really fueled me. I also wanted him to be proud of me. You know, I wanted him to look up and say, that's my mom. Are you known for your mantra, no C's? I mean, he's playing basketball, but clearly education was important. Basketball was always my leverage. So third and fourth grade, he was supposed to play in a tournament mm -hmm. and he got he didn't do his best in school. Mm -hmm. And you're like, um, you're not playing. Oh yeah, pulled his card early. And what was your reaction then, fast forward to Jason leaving Duke after his freshman year to enter the draft? He knows that my desire is for him to eventually go back and get his degree. He also likes to point out that I have four degrees <laughs> and he makes significantly more money than I ever had. Kind of fair. I was like, that's logical, you got a point. When did you know that this kid has something? When did you know this is for real? Around fourth grade, I knew he was gifted. He would do things and make moves and uh, that you just couldn't teach, right? And it, it was like, it was just innate in him. For parents who have young people who play sports, mm -hmm. where is the line between pushing and letting kids be kids? We can't want it more than they do. Hmm. That's the biggest thing. And I think sometimes we want to push them more. And so that was the line for me. I would tell them, listen, I will give you every opportunity, every resource. I'll do whatever it takes, but you have to do your part. What's it like watching him play? It has changed. Early on, I was still in that, I got to push you. You know, I got to text him at halftime. In the NBA? Yes. <laughs> because I felt like he needed a little fire up under him. I'm like, are you gonna play today? Oh yeah, you are tough love. Yeah, I was. But then I realized, you know, fans are pretty brutal. And I realized like everybody in this arena is on his back or, you know, social media and everybody. So I, then I 
decided. I, he has to have one place to look. That's mm. always, you know, yeah. a head yeah. nod, a yeah. you got it, like calm down. You know, just something reassuring. Seeing him as a father, what does that feel like, seeing Jason as a father? Oh, it's amazing to get to see Jason in a different light, you know, in a different capacity and see that something that I never thought possible would bring him more joy than basketball. I think Deuce helps put things in perspective for him. Does Deuce recognize what daddy does? He knows that, you know, daddy is famous. He knows he's famous too. Deuce knows he's a superstar. Deuce waves like he's on a float at the arena when he walks by to the chance. But I don't think he quite understands how good daddy is yet. Biggest piece of advice for other moms? Unconditional love and support. You'll be amazed what young people are capable of doing when they know they have unwavering, unconditional love and support. No denying mom did an amazing job, and Jason is among the favorites to win league MVP. Up next, the hit Broadway musical Six. It tells the story of six wives of Henry VIII. We sat down with one of the play's stars to hear her story, a remarkable journey to Broadway. On Broadway at the Lena Horne Theater, the curtain rises, spotlight hits the stage, and it is Haley Kaleem Wright's time to shine. She plays Catherine of Aragon, a character reclaiming her story in the Tony Award winning musical Six. And now it's time for the 29 year old to reclaim hers. To be a leading lady in a show with all these beautiful, strong women next to me, it doesn't get any better. After high school, her family moved from Houston to New York City, so both Haley and her mom, Asia, who was also a performer, could pursue their dreams. Part of us moving to New York and the whole reason was because she had seen in me something that I didn't even see in myself. But things didn't go as planned. They soon found themselves at the Department of Homeless Services. Their story was documented in a 2013 episode of MTV's True Life. So we have to leave the shelter and get placed into a new one. The process, she says, was dehumanizing. There was no other choice but to make it through and to survive. At 20, Haley and her mom moved back to Texas. Work overseas gave her a glimpse of success, but a Houston flood washed it all away. They were houseless yet again. So with just $200 to her name, Haley booked a one-way flight back to New York City. How have you always had this faith? The thing that I love about New York is that even when I was unhoused, I still had the opportunity to see glimpses of what my future could be. Walking past these Broadway stages, and I'm imagining walking in the stage door as I'm walking to my retail job. It was also kind of me being a little defiant, like I'm not going to fail. I want to challenge every stereotype, every thought about whatever you think of unhoused people, black people, whatever, that mm -mm, we are more than what you could ever imagine. We can't talk about your story and not talk about your mom. She was a country music singer assigned to a whole country music label. Black woman doing country, unheard of in that time, you know, and, and she always was so fierce of protecting me. It's your first night on that stage and you know that your mom is there watching you play Catherine of Aragon. The thought that comes to me is like, look what God has done. And like, I'm so proud of us. I'm so proud of us making it through to the next day. Where did you find the strength mm. to keep going? Everything that we've been through, there was not a moment where it's like, oh, I'm just gonna give up now. What do you do? You figure it out. What's it like watching your baby shine? Ooh, it's otherworldly. You know, this is a piece of my heart. Ooh. <laughs> this is a living, breathing piece of me. The lights go on in the Lena Horn Theater, and the first person we see and the first words we hear, they come from you. What's that first line? Listen up, let me tell you a story. Have you really sat with that and understood the magnitude of that being the first line we hear and it being yours? When you say it just now, I'm, it gives me goosebumps and it gives me chills because it's like, man, I, I never saw, I never put two and two together until now. I feel like 
everybody's had a situation that's knocked them further than they expected to fall. And it's not about the falling, it's about getting back up. And you ain't seen nothing yet. This is just the beginning. And for the first time, Asia got to see her daughter displayed on the front of a Broadway theater. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. Oh, you look so beautiful. We did no, it. You did it. You did it. I'm so proud. I love you. And all the, not just this. This is just a small piece of who you are. I love you, you so much. Coming up, we've got even more feel-good stories after the break. Welcome back to the Boost. An all-girls robotics team, they call themselves the Nerdettes, is bonding over their passion for STEM and building something special for the future. Here's today's Dylan Dreyer. It's not just about building a robot, it's about building your character. High school student Emily King is a part of the Nerdettes, along with Ellen Vegarita, Sydney McMurray, Haley Holsenback, Lily Sullivan, and Megan Quinn. And so we have our arm that we can go up and down and grab cones with forming an all-girls robotics team in Huntsville, Alabama. This squad bonded because of Emily, who started robotics 10 years ago. I really didn't like it at first because that I was on a co-ed team and the boys didn't want the girls doing robotics. They wanted them doing posters and I wasn't interested in that. So that's when we went to an all-girls team throughout my Girl Scout troop and it's just grown since then. How did it change once you created this all-girl team? Well, what mostly changed is that there's no judgment in an all-girls team. Like, there's nobody thinking that the girls can't do what somebody else can do because we're all girls. We all know that we have the same capabilities and that we can all do the same jobs. Such an important message to get out there. Some of our brains are really good at math and science and robotics, and it doesn't matter if you're a girl or a boy. Is that kind of the message? It's not that girls are better at robotics than boys, and it's not that boys are better at robotics than girls. It's that we can all do the same things, and I don't think that's always seen that way. We have the nerdettes. The nerdettes are part of the FIRST Robotics Program, which stands for For Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. It's a nonprofit organization geared for all young learners from pre-K through 12th grade. Currently, there are more than 500,000 students across 98 countries who compete at different levels with robots they've built and programmed. And last year, the Nerdettes' determination took them all the way to the world championship in their league, proving that girls want to have fun in robotics. 
I think it just brings a shock to all the other teams when we do robotics. They don't make it as fun as it could be. You know, we go in there, we go in there with our colors and our music and the pink and we're all girls and we're fun and we're loud. And I just think that that's different out there. Autonomous starts in three, two, one. Besides technical and programming skills, the girls have learned more about themselves throughout the process and built up their own sisterhood. Made such great friends that I'll probably be friends with for a very long time. <laughs> learned about yourself as as you compete in these competitions from this from these competitions I've definitely been able to voice myself a lot better I used to be like very very shy and so I learned confidence and I learned just to have enthusiasm for all of it I love getting out there and getting to talk to businesses and companies and like talking about my team before robotics like there's no way that I would have gotten up and talked to the people that I do now presenting ourselves and I've learned that that's something that I really like to do and they're even sharing their spark for STEM with younger students too, who call themselves the Gear Girls. We like to think of the whole team as like our younger sisters and we like to help them out and just get them started in STEM and hopefully encourage them to go down the path of STEM. <laughs> and why do you think it's important to, you know, be an example for, for younger girls? I think we just want to encourage that out there more. If you don't hear about girls in robotics, there's nothing wrong with being in a STEM field. It can still be girly. From sisterhood to brotherhood and nature, Black Men Hike is an organization promoting mental and physical health. And NBC's Steve Patterson laced up his hiking shoes to find out what it's all about. Amid the serene beauty of the Santa Monica Mountains, where the lush hillside gives way to the sea, an unconventional gathering. Good morning, fellas. Good morning. Okay, okay, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, welcome to Black Men Hike. Nearly 60 black men here for something hard to find in the brick and mortar of Los Angeles. Black Men Hike is a safe space for us to kind of enjoy nature, enjoy each other, and uh, just, you know, uh, fellowship. In 2017, Jelani Natty, an accountant by trade, moved to Los Angeles from Akron, Ohio, and at the urging of his wife, ventured out onto the trails of Southern California. <laughs> at first I was hesitant, and as I started to hike, I started to feel something. I started to feel recharged. Um, I started to feel lighter, and it was something that I wanted to kind of share with my community. In 2019, he invited five friends to go hiking and began Black Men Hike. Thank you for coming to our last hike of the year. Each month on the first Saturday, a group gathers in a different location in Southern California. I would suggest you if you are a brother of a certain age, you might want to do a little bit of stretching before we get started. <laughs> Introductions are made and intentions are set. I come to this really for the fellowship. And then the group sets off. Are you enjoying this hike, the nature? It's wonderful. Moita Hayden spends his days at the Los Angeles City's Attorney's Office, but for Black Men Hike, he's an yeah. ambassador. We didn't realize how important it was for all of us to have some time to spend with each other. We didn't realize how important the interconnection between each other really was. And it's not just about community. In a society where black men often struggle with high blood pressure, depression, and higher rates of stress and isolation, it's a chance in like company to nourish mind, body, and spirit. Yeah. Hikes often begin as a jovial march, but as you duck under trees, navigate winding narrow trails, and go up, up, and up, you realize that this hike is not the proverbial walk in the park. It's for real. <laughs> this is not, <laughs> This is not a like leisurely hike. And that's on purpose. The exertion and the environment quickly strip away any pretense and inhibitions. How are people feeling so far about this? Start to regret it a little bit, huh? Can't go back. Can't go back, though. Can't go back now. But after more than an hour heading up, the payoff. I'm like, yo, this is why I got out of bed. <laughs> All right, fellas, we made it to the top. Clap yourself up. A sense of accomplishment, a moment to meditate. You gotta take a deep breath in, breathe out. Deep breath in, again the view. And a breathtaking view. What do you love most about doing this? I think um, with a lot of things that's going on in the world, sometimes, um, particularly for black men, it, it becomes challenging. Um, so, you know, the opportunity to come out here and for us to, you know, meditate and have conversation and hold each other accountable, I think it's just a powerful moment for us to, uh, really connect. 
It's an outdoor fraternity, a tribe. What do you think draws people to this experience? The fact that there's not a lot of safe spaces for black men to congregate and get together and talk about the things that they go through. Um, and it's just an opportunity to unplug. Finding in nature something that can be difficult to find at home. To have an opportunity to do it with a bunch of black men, I think that is the draw. And then the brotherhood that it creates, man, it's priceless. Can't beat it. Can't beat it. Black men hiding! <laughs> when we come back, a viral video that will put a smile on your face. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Boost. We have one more video for you to check out today. Take a look. Three high school students in Callisburg, Texas, got word that their 80-year-old custodian, who they call Mr. James, was forced out of retirement because he could not afford a big rent increase at home. So what did they do? They started a GoFundMe page. It had a goal of $10,000. Before long, that amount kept growing, and it kept growing. And this morning, oh. check it out. Stands wow. at $144,000. Wow. One of the students who helped raise that money said nobody that age should be working. They should be living Absolutely. out the rest of their life. Always leaves us with a smile. That's all for today. We'll see you next week with more of The Boost on Today All Day. Fashion editor Chassie Post and I know trends. Each week I'm here with the must-have fashion and beauty products at a price you will like in Style Finder. I'm Shop Today editorial director Adriana Brock and I'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media and influencer trends. And I'm Shop All Day contributor Jen Fallick. I love finding the best versions of everyday items in better basics. This is Shop All Day, simple solutions for the whole family. Hi, I'm fashion and beauty editor Chassie Post, and we're back today with Shop All Day. And this entire episode is about finding simple solutions for the entire family. And we're talking about must-have products that makes cooking in the kitchen a breeze to the one dress to keep in your closet for special occasions. We're bringing you super staples, from gadgets to fashion that will simplify your life. And who doesn't want that? Staples don't have to be boring. In fact, they can be statement making. So get ready for some simple solutions that are on trend, on point, and anything but stale. You know how we said that staples don't have to be ordinary? Well, there's nothing ordinary about these denim updates for both women and men. They elevate the everyday. So let's start with our women's upgrade, a whole new way to wear denim. Meet the denim shirt dress, and she is way cool. And I absolutely love this shirt dress. And it actually reminds me of one of my favorite denim staples, the button-down denim shirt, but just elongated. And what people love so much about this dress is it is beyond versatile. So you can wear it as a little dress. You can actually wear it as a tunic. 
You can put it over leggings or you can open it up, wear it over a t-shirt and wear it as a shacket. Yep, <laughs> that's the shirt jacket hybrid. And it comes in lots of different washes. And another thing I really like about it is the fun French detail. I mean, you don't often see, you know, details like that on something so affordable. So this is truly a dress that you're going to reach for again and again, but it has a little something extra. So next up for men, we've got the Software Slim Jeans with Washwell from The Gap. Guys, I think, no offense, need a little bit more help when it comes to denim than women. So what if I told you guys that you could wear an on-trend jean, that slim cut, that was just as comfortable, or maybe even more comfortable than the dad jeans that you've got in your closet? Well, then I'm sure you would wear them, right? So here we have the Great Gap Software Jean. So what people really love about these jeans is that they have a really great silhouette, that great slim silhouette, but they are pure comfort. They're made from a fabric that is super duper soft. And there's stretch in these. Another thing we like, they're part of the Gap Washwell program, so they're good for the planet and they come in all of your favorite washes. So guys, no excuses anymore. You've got a great on-trend pair of jeans that are just as comfortable as the ones that you reach for every single day. Next, we've got a statement-making staple for mom or women in your life. So this is the halter neck maxi dress, and every woman needs a go-to dress in their closet that they feel confident in when the invitation calls for a dressy or more formal attire. And I've gotta say, you know, when I get an invitation like that, I go into panic. I think, oh my gosh, you know, do I have to buy a new dress? What's on trend? Do I have to spend a million dollars? And the answer is, no, you do not. <laughs> this dress has you totally covered. First of all, it's got lots of great big trends that we're seeing for the season in one. It's got that great boho look. It's got the halter neck style, which is actually really flattering, you know, for the shoulders and the arms. And actually down at the bottom ruffle, it's got a sheer detail, which we saw tons of all over the runways. And it's actually quite beautiful. So this is a great dress to wear to a wedding if you're a guest. This is also a great dress for your bridesmaids. I mean, it comes in 29 different colors and patterns. And it comes in two lengths. You can choose a maxi length that goes to the floor, or you can choose T length or midi length. Now it's not every day that one of our favorite staples, a tote becomes iconic, but that's exactly what this little tote has become. It's called the Camo Zip Hunter's Tote Bag. And this is from L.L. Bean. And this brand is an American classic. They've been around for over a century and they're known for being outdoor outfitters and they're famous for the duck boot. So somewhere along the way, this little utilitarian tote became a high fashion darling. I'm not kidding you guys, pretty much every fashionista I know has one of these camo totes. It's made out of marine grade material and to clean it, guess what? You can just hose it down, so trust us. These totes can take anything your family might throw at it. What we love about the totes as well is they have a zipper top, so that means they're great for travel, nothing's gonna fall out, and they have a detachable shoulder strap. But my very, very favorite thing about it, you can monogram it. I mean, how about that? An everyday tote is really sort of taken up a few notches just by adding the monogram. And I think that's what makes it so special. And the totes come in three different sizes, so there's a size for everyone. I like to say that the family that styles together smiles together. Here we have the Adidas Grand Court Sneaker. Sneakers for the whole family, and these are triple number one bestsellers. They're bestsellers for men, bestsellers for women, bestsellers for kids. And what people love so much about them is they're stylish enough to be called a fashion sneaker, but boy, are they tough enough to take on the playground or running around the streets. And they've got the little Velcro enclosures, which I love. I love those for adults, if I can also be honest. There is a ton of option when it comes to color. 
So I'm envisioning a family photograph. So everybody picks out their favorite color. And I really am hoping you guys will send us one of these family photos. What could be cuter, right? You know, fashion is a family affair. So last but not least, we have the ultimate in everyday accessories for not only mommy, but also for her mini me. We have an adorable mommy and me set. It's called the lock and key set. And look, here we have a gorgeous heart. It's engraved on the back. It says my whole heart. And then we have this little key for her little one. And they both have lots of gorgeous little gemstones on them so they can twin. And then, if you love bracelets, we've got another fun Mommy and Me set. It's called the Super Stack. It comes in a set of eight bracelets. They're super stretchy and they're really comfortable and they have little charms that have hidden meanings. There's even a little booklet in the sets that tells you what the charms mean. So, you know, you can uh, play around with mom or grandma or your auntie and create little love messages that you can each wear on your wrist. And let's face it, I mean, what's cuter? than a mommy and me arm party. Pretty much nothing. <laughs> Let's run through all the products one more time. We've got the denim shirt dresses, the men's slim jeans, the halter dress, the L.L. Bean Zip Hunters tote bag, the Adidas sneakers for the entire family, and lastly, the Super Smalls Lock and Key Mommy and Me necklace and bracelet set. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. That's it for Style Finder. Up next, Adriana Brock is talking with the Bella sisters, Nikki and Brie Bella, about motherhood and their favorite products for busy moms, including a simple one-step bottle maker and stick around. Jen Fallick is sharing the ultimate better basic for your family, the couch coaster. Stay with us. Welcome back. I'm Adriana Brock, Shop Today Editorial Director, and this is Influencer Trends, 
where I'll be talking to industry insiders and they're gonna share their favorite products and must have items to shop for right now. Our show today is all about simple solutions for the entire family and I'm so excited to talk to two WWE Hall of Famers, podcasters, authors, entrepreneurs, the list goes on. The Superstar Sisters, Moms, Nikki and Brie Bella, and they recently partnered with a brand called Kalugo. Hey, how are you guys? It's so good to see you. Me too. Thank you for having us. Yes, I'm so excited to talk to you because I'm a mom to be and you guys have some really awesome solutions for the family today. But before I get into that, you do this thing on Instagram called Sister Sunday and you recently got matching haircuts, which is so cute. Tell me how that started. So my sister becoming a new mom, I was like, listen, there's moments in the week where you just need to hit the refresh button, you need time for yourself, and just kind of feel like the old Nicole before you know you had Mateo. And we are so lucky to have amazing men who allowed us this one day every week. They watch the kids and we get to go do whatever we want. And because Mickey and I live in wine country now, it was like, okay, every Sunday's wine day team day. And then we just started calling it Sister Sunday. And we just, it's our special day to let loose, have fun, yeah. and hit the refresh button. Oh, that's so sweet. And I love that you guys do things together to bond. That's really nice, especially like these new haircuts that I know people on social media were buzzing about. I mean, I hate saying the old Nicole, but you know, the non-mom Nicole, and I kept telling Brie, this is not working out. Like, I am just not feeling the butt. And she's like, figure out what you want for your next chapter. So literally we both send each other info pics of what we want our new haircuts to look like. And they were like identical. identical. So we're like, well, let's just do it. Let's get identical perfect. hair. That's perfect. And speaking of sort of, like you said, pre-baby, Brie, I feel like your style has always been really boho and like laid back. And Nikki, you're all about the glamour. So I'm wondering how your style has changed since becoming mom. Not as many midriffs. Um, yeah. I, it definitely has just become a bit more mature. Um, I still love to be glamorous, but I feel like I kind of am more of an old Hollywood glam than like a pop star glam, I guess you can say. Okay. When we go out and about, like, how do I want to present myself as a woman and as a mom? And it's weird because the times that I've kind of been a little more edgy, I actually feel uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm like, wait, I get it why you cover up a little bit more. It's almost like the grown up version of your signature style. 100% so true. Yeah, and another thing you guys are shopping for is baby gear. And you guys actually teamed up with Kalugo to sort of put your Bella sisters twist on a bunch of their items. So. Tell me about these, because I have a few of them here. I have the stroller, the carrier, and the diaper tote. Well, I have to say, the carrier, which I have right here as well, um, this is our dream color. And for us, especially new moms who aren't used to baby carriers, carriers can just be so complicated. And they shouldn't be, because a lot of the times, us and the baby, we're alone together. It's a simple baby carrier, but it's still chic. It has a fanny pack, so you don't need to carry anything else. And you know, the Dune, we have quite a few colors. We have the Bella Red, which I love. And our Dune color is so perfect for his and her. But literally, we're up here at the lake every morning. We go on an hour hike, and Mateo's in his carrier. And he's so happy. That's Mom, so it. sweet. And I just love it. Well, and I think the great thing is what we did with Lugo, as you notice. Like, you can wear an outfit like this. And the colors that Nikki and I picked, so we really wanted to come up with colors that didn't sacrifice your outfit. That's so went. cute. You guys are like totally on point with your outfits and these matching tights. Right. <laughs> we knew exactly what was going to go with the whole closet. We're right. like, okay, this is perfect. Exactly. <laughs> and so, but the biggest thing is we are on the go mom, like so many mothers. We yeah. are working like everyone. And um, we wanted things that were simple, easy to use, but you weren't sacrificing quality for quantity. So that's what our you know mission is at Kalugo, which I'm just so proud of. Beyond Kalugo, you guys also shared with me a few solutions that can make a big difference for parents. We've got the baby Brezza gadgets that you say are a game changer and you both use this brand. Oh yes. yes. There's the sterilizer and this like formula dispenser that to me, it looks so like I, a barista machine for a baby. Formula in here and then the water's in the back. You put up here how many ounces you need and you just hit start. And it comes out the perfect, and you put your temperature. So it's literally a couple seconds and you get the most perfect bottle. 
And when I saw, I saw this with my cousin, I was um, staying with them and I watched them make the bottle. And now I breastfed and then I went to formula. And I'm like, oh my gosh, when I do formula and doing that, it just takes that stress away, you know? And you know, the temperature is perfect. The amount is perfect. Right. So this right here is like gold. If you're screaming, crying because they're hungry and the bottle's too hot, you're like, wait, just give me a couple minutes. You told me it's not right. It's awful. It's <laughs> great. And you guys also shared with us a few affordable finds that you find that are game changers for the family, including one that I'm just so intrigued by. It's a snot sucker. Bree had me get it with Mateo before he was born. She goes, just trust me, you have to have this in your nursery. We used it a lot as a new, when he was a newborn. Kids don't know how to blow their noses. I, I you know, well, newborn babies are just yeah. so sensitive around the nostril area, at least Mateo was, so that we could never wipe him. Like even to this day, it's hard to wipe his nose now. Yeah, and I always would do it to myself first, so he would think it. Was bad. <laughs> and so I was cute. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, and he like thinks it's hilarious. It's so funny. So. And then what about this a silicone? teether oh it's cute. Oh, yeah. the greatest teething hack of all time so um when mateo started teething and you put in frozen blueberries some frozen peas or, nice. peas or camel milk or bananas but i use blueberries okay and put the frozen blueberries in here you put this on top you give it to them and then the baby just chews on it and so the frozen blueberries not only numb the gums, but then they're starting to get this blueberry juice and they become so happy and i can't tell you how much I have used this during this whole teething process. Right. I use this almost every day. Yeah, so it's, cool. And if you don't want the mess of blueberries, like the cold I don't care. I let him chew blueberries everywhere. Peas, bananas, all of that. Yeah. It's just, it's so. You could yeah. freeze anything pretty much. Anything and put it in. I know you guys were talking about your sons. They were actually born a day apart, I read. And they're coming Our. up. Yeah, they're coming up on their first birthday, which is so exciting. Do they have any plans to celebrate together? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So we are doing a dual birthday party. This might be a tradition for the boys every year, the way we shared birthday. Uh -huh. We're excited to celebrate them together. I know. Happy early birthday to the two of them. And it was so great chatting with you both today. Thank you so much for sharing all these great gadgets with us and all your awesome mom hacks. I am so excited to try all these products for myself. Yay, thank that makes you. Yeah, thank you for having thank us. Thank you so much for having us. And maybe you can join us on a Sunday one. I will <laughs> have to take you up on that if I'm ever in wine country. Let's run through all the products one more time. We have the Kalugo stroller, the Kalugo carrier, the Kalugo diaper tote, the Baby Bretza Formula Pro, the Baby Bretza Sterilizer, the Boone Pulp Feeder, the Nose Frida. Up next, Jen Fallick is bringing you better basics.
welcome back. I'm Shop All Day contributor Jen Fallick here to show you some of my favorite staples for the whole family, many of which have become better basic cult classics. And see that QR code at the bottom of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. So let's get to it. This first item is an OG Better Basic that I still use daily at my home. This is the Snap-On Strainer. Colanders can be big, bulky. They take up a lot of storage. They take up room in the sink. No longer. This snap-on strainer is a quarter of the size of a traditional strainer, and it snaps onto pretty much any size saucepan or saute pan. All you do, clip it on, whatever you're cooking, you're taking the strain out of straining because you pick it up, tilt it over the sink, strain out all the liquids, and you're still left with what's in the pot. It is so much easier than transferring things back and forth. Huge, huge time saver. I mean, anytime I make pasta, this is the way that I strain it. It keeps everything you need in the pot, in the pot, strains thoroughly, and again, it works on so many different sizes that you literally just need one of these, and you can pretty much cover anything that you're possibly making that needs to be strained. Another genius better basic for the kitchen is this automatic can opener. You guys, I don't know where this thing has been all my life. Since I started using it, I can't imagine going back to the old way. This electric can opener literally does all the work for you. Pick it up, you press the button, it makes its way around the can. When you're done, when you see that the can's been fully open, press the button again, the top pops off, and there you go. No danger, no mess, nothing, just a perfectly open can. This electric can opener really does do all the work for you. While you're doing other things in the kitchen, this is getting that job done, and you can move on with whatever it is you're making. So next up, this is the couch coaster. Originally, I had one. Then my kids kept stealing it. Then my husband was stealing it. Then we were all fighting over it. So now we own four, we each have our own color because we cannot watch TV or do really anything as a family chilling out without these. The couch coaster is this genius innovation. It's weighted at the bottom so it stays where you put it. It'll work on multiple different size couch arms. And inside you place the beverage of your choice. It also has like a little ring so you can adjust the size. If you're having like a bottle of beer, it's football season. This is like a football season must have. Drape this over the arm of the couch, sit down, put your beer right inside. It's within arm's reach, it doesn't spill. For family movie nights, we simply take out the little insert so it fits a big, generous mug of tea, of hot cocoa, and wherever we're sitting, we always have the couch coaster right next to us. I give this also as a teacher's gift. It's a great gift for someone that you don't know what to buy for. People don't have this and everybody needs it. Anyone who I've ever given this to has thanked me multiple times over and then subsequently bought them for their entire family. The couch coaster is a true Better Basics iconic essential. Next up, since we said simple solutions for the entire family, not only does the entire family love all these things, I also get my entire family in on selecting Better Basics products to test. This next one came from my six-year-old. If you've got young kids who are not so into brushing their teeth, which I'm just assuming, unless it's just me, no young kids are into brushing their teeth, this is going to change everything. This is the Brushies toothbrush. What's so special about this is not only is it incredibly adorable, I mean, look at this, we got a llama, a giraffe, an alligator, but it has everything all in one contained little packet right here. You've got the electric toothbrush that's easy to press on and off, also very important with young kids. It's frustrating when they can't turn it on and off themselves they can do that with this. You have an extra brush head, you've got a cup, you've got a protector for the brush head so that it doesn't get dirty when it's sitting around in their bathroom. But the clincher here is it has a timer. This timer times out two minutes, which is the amount of time that they should be brushing their teeth. This is, yeah, like the old school sort of sand timer. They love watching it. My six-year-old is mesmerized. She has never had cleaner teeth since this came into our lives. Again, you can put it on a countertop or it actually comes with, with um, mounting equipment. So if you want to put it on the wall, you can do that too. And it's just so much fun. Fun, efficient, effective, a better basics win. If anyone in your family needs help with insomnia, you need to try this. You can use this sleep device without disrupting the sleep of anyone else in the room. What's great about this is that it doesn't bother anybody and it works tremendously. This is the Dadao Sleep Gadget. You can see here, it's just this little disc, so easy to put right on your nightstand, or you can even rest it, you know, sort of on your chest while you're falling asleep at night. And what this does is it uses breathing techniques to lull you into a really calm, deep sleep. The light will go on and then dim, goes on again and dims. 
It's really easy to follow, really easy to figure out. All it is, a simple disc that's gonna change the way you fall asleep at night. Nothing is more frustrating than when you're pulling out something to wear and then you notice it's wrinkled. So this steamer that has over 48,000 great reviews on Amazon is a must. I love it because it's easy to use, it's compact, and according to the company's claims, they say that it will give you 15 minutes of consistent steam. This way, you can steam an entire outfit and then some without having to refill, without having to start over. It's also designed really well. It's very ergonomic, it's easy to hold, and really easy to store. This next Better Basic is the ultimate time saver, you guys. You never have to tie your shoelaces again when you've got these, especially if you're trying to get out the door quickly with kids. I love these for myself, I love these for my kids. These are Hickey's laces. And what they are is they're little like rubber loops. Take out the laces that come in your sneakers and instead replace it with these great little rubber loops. They're gonna keep your shoes secure, but they also give you a little give so it's easy to slip your shoes on and off. And they come in a ton of fun colors. We did a pink, we did a white, but you can mix and match them. So you can make a fun design, you can make them different colors for a school spirit day. It makes your shoes so easy to slip on and off. Slip-on shoes are very on trend right now for multiple reasons. This takes the shoes you already own and makes them slip-ons. And finally, we have got the ultimate Hollywood essential. This is the Style Emergency Kit. And what I love about this, and I've owned this for years, this takes celebrity stylist giant suitcase that they travel around with, and it puts everything important in there into one teeny little box. You have got anything and everything from you know, something to get deodorant stains off, from hem tape, a needle and thread, all of the essentials that you end up needing when you're out and about, never seem to have on you, come tucked inside this one little box. I love it because there's things in here that I'll use for myself and things that I often need for my family. There's band-aids, all of the stuff that I never remember to put in my bag, is already in the style emergency kit. It is a true better basic lifesaver. Let's go through these products one more time and you can use the QR code to get instant access to these items. We've got the snap-on strainer, the electric can opener, the couch coaster, the brushies toothbrush, the sleep gadget, the steamer, the hickeys laces, and the style emergency kit. And that's a wrap on Better Basics and for our show. It has been so much fun showing you guys our favorite. And tune in next week for an all new episode of Shop All Day. Thanks for watching. Sponsored by Walmart. Welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. Now everybody loves a hearty meal. But when the cooking is done, nobody loves doing dishes. So today, we're making three delicious recipes that all come together in just one pot. I'm making a one pan chicken pot pie with some of my favorite spring veggies. I'm whipping up Tuscan style tortellini soup. And I'm making my flavor packed Thai inspired green curry noodles. You can shop the ingredients featured here from our sponsor, Walmart, by scanning the QR code. Today earns a commission from purchases made through links on today.com. Growing up, it was always a treat for me and my siblings to make frozen chicken pot pies when my parents were out to dinner and we had to fend for ourselves. And today I will be making a more grown up version of this classic comfort food. This recipe has some of my favorite veggies and I know your whole family will absolutely love it. So the first thing we're gonna do is get our onion going. Look at that stunning dice. Move those onions off to the side to prep the rest of our veg. This is fennel, gorgeous, gorgeous fennel. Bulb, fronds, and the stems, okay? So I really love using fennel in honestly any kind of cooking. I promise you all of that anise flavor is going to mellow out beautifully once it hits the pan. We have these fronds here. We're gonna just give them a nice rough chop. So we've taken the stem off and then I'm going to cut it in half like so. We'll go from the top to the back like so. 
and then rock it through from the back to the front. Let's quickly do our celery. And the theme here is green. I don't know if you can tell. All green veggies, that's what we're working with today. Okay, finally our garlic clove. And you also don't have to worry about chopping this too fine. So let's get to sauteing. We are going to add in a nice hunk of unsalted butter. We are also going to add in some olive oil. Once it is all melted and as it starts bubbling like so, that is when we know to add in our veggies. These will all go in at the same time. These veggies are really running away from me here. <laughs> okay. We want these veggies to break down, to caramelize a bit, to develop their flavor. And while that is going, we are going to get to work on the rest of our veggies because believe it or not, we are adding even more vegetables to this already full vegetation experience. All right. So next up, we have our kale. This is lacinato kale, also known as dinosaur kale. It is flat. It's not as crazy and curly like curly kale. And my favorite way to prepare it is I will take the bottom right where the stem is, grab either side, and then take my finger and pull that stem right through. And there you go. Okay, so while this is going, we are actually going to add even more flavor with some fresh thyme. And then what we're gonna do is we're just going to bunch it on up in pieces, slice it thin, just like so. How about that? Fabulous. We're gonna get to work on our chicken, a great shortcut that I love to do is I love to use a rotisserie chicken. I am pulling off this skin just because we don't necessarily need it and we can chop this up. My siblings prefer white meat and I prefer dark meat with chicken, so it's good. We'll have a little for me and then the rest for my sibbies. Okay, looking good. So, now that our veggies are ready to rock, it is time to create what I like to call an almost roux. <laughs> so we are just going to add in this all-purpose flour, but it's really important when you add in flour to a pot pie, to anything as a thickening agent, that you take the time to cook the flour down. So we wanna just keep cooking this down for about two to three minutes. Okay, it's time to thicken this up. We're gonna start by doing one cup of the stock. We wanna make sure that all of this flour breaks down. And now what we wanna do is we wanna bring this to a simmer to continue thickening it a bit more. Next up, we are going to add in our kale to wilt it and to also thicken up our mixture a bit. And now that this looks nice and thick, we're going to add in our final ingredients, our peas, our fennel fronds, and our chopped up chicken. This is my favorite thing to do with a homemade pot pie. I love using puff pastry, store-bought. I'm taking a little bit of all-purpose flour and just giving it a nice light dusting. Open it on up. This is one sheet of puff pastry. We're gonna give this one more light dusting of flour. Take your rolling pin. The main thing here is to make sure that you roll it out so that it fits whatever pan you are working with. And we're just going to fold it, bring our pan over, lift it up, and then open it up 
like a book and dress it right over the top. You're cute, you're gorgeous. I love ya. We wanna make sure that we have about one inch around our cast iron. And you can just trim the corners off of that pastry. I have egg wash right here. And the reason why we're popping this onto the top and brushing it over the top of our pastry is because if we don't, what's gonna happen is our pastry is gonna end up looking a little sad. So we're just taking a pastry brush and really delicately brushing that egg wash over the top and the sides of the pastry. Okay, we wanna make sure it has some ventilation. You wanna make sure that you have at least three, maybe four, right in the center of that pie so that steam can escape. And then my favorite little extra layer of pizzazz is to take some flaky salt and sprinkle it over the top of this pot pie. So this is going to go into the oven for about 25 to 30 minutes and just check about halfway through. Oh man, our pot pie has cooled. We want it to cool for about 10 minutes after it comes out of the oven. And now there's only one thing left to do, slice it up and give it a taste. And then we're gonna give this a nice big scoop. Oh yeah. Look at that. Mmm. It is unbelievable how food can instantly transport you back to a moment. It is just bursting with spring beauty and energy. I love it. One more bite, because we deserve it. I absolutely love Italian food, just like everybody else. It's so comforting and it always tends to hit the spot. Now with minimal prep, my tortellini soup is just a thing to make at the end of a long day because it's just in one pot. All right, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna fire up the big pot that you have in your kitchen. I'm gonna set it onto a medium high heat. Next, we're gonna move on to the sausage. This is spicy Italian sausage. I think it adds a lot of flavor. Just remove the casing from the sausage. Well, sticky little thing, isn't it? <laughs> then we're just gonna put this right into the pan right now. Squeeze that sausage right on out, right into that pot. Right now, I'm breaking up the meat, so that way it'll be dispersed. It'll cook a little bit faster. Let's move on to chop up our veggies. So I've got some onion here. We're just gonna dice this up, slice it in half. And you can do generous chunks. There we go. 
moving on, we got some fresh tomatoes here. Gonna dice these up as well. All right, and you know what? I'm thinking our sausage is about finished. Yeah, it's great. It's got a great color on there. We're gonna take a slotted spoon and we're gonna remove the sausage because we don't wanna take out the oil. We want the oil from that sausage to help out with the flavor. There we go. Now, since there's not a lot of oil left after the sausage, I am gonna add in just a little bit of olive oil. I'm gonna add in my onions and we're gonna saute those. You know I am a garlic lover and if you love Italian food, you gotta be a garlic lover too. Now, got some carrots here. Because they're so small, I'm not gonna peel them. I'm just gonna begin to dice them up as well. But just make sure you wash your carrots. Give that a nice stir. All right. In goes the garlic. Slide that on in. Give it another stir. And we're gonna cook this for about one minute. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna deglaze the bottom of this pot. We're gonna do that with some red wine because we're fancy here in the Today All Day Kitchen. So grab your favorite red wine. I'm gonna be using a blend and we're gonna add about a half a cup. There we go. And if you wanna toast yourself during this recipe, I won't judge you, that's your business. Mm -hmm. Let this simmer down. And in go the tomatoes. I'm gonna let the tomatoes rest in here with the onions and the red wine and garlic. Let that simmer for a minute. I'm gonna finish preparing the rest of our veggies. Basil. I'm gonna roll them up, stack the leaves. And I'm just gonna just like this. Beautiful. That should be enough. I'm gonna reserve some too for garnish at the very end. Check back in on our tomatoes and onions and look at this. You can see how thick it is. It's kind of slushy. That's exactly the texture that we want. I think this looks good. What about y'all? Yeah, Kevin, it looks real good. Okay, let's start to bring everything else together. I'm gonna add in some oregano. Adding back in the sausage as well. Give this a good stir. And then our stock, pour it in. This is some chicken stock. Another pinch of salt, some black pepper. And lastly, I'm gonna sprinkle in some basil. Boom. Do we want some heat? Yeah, Kev, we want the heat, bring the heat. All right, some red pepper, boom. I'm gonna crank up the heat so that it comes to a boil and then as soon as it starts to boil, you're gonna to wanna to reduce the heat down to a simmer.
gonna take some kale. All I'm doing is folding the you know, kale over, and I'm gonna take out the big stem. Take it at the very top, and just drag the knife along the stem. Comes right out. And then just do a chop. Just like this. This is great. Still simmering. Ready, in, go. The kale. Beautiful. And this is some cheese fuel tortellini. I'm gonna cook this for about five minutes. You can cover and let this simmer. All right, I think this is done. I'm gonna turn off the heat of our pot and we're gonna plate this amazing one pot Tuscan tortellini soup. And this soup deserves the good bowls, okay? I'm just gonna say that, it deserves it. Get a big scoop. Oh yeah, we've got the color from the carrots, color from the kale, and color from the tomatoes. Mm, beautiful. Let's garnish. Pepper. A little bit of dried oregano, if you want some. Beautiful. Basil. There we go. And look at this. Holy smokes. Cannot wait to devour this soup. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Oh my lord. That is a delicious soup. Now, I'm not team soup only in the wintertime. I'm team soup all year long. You want to come home to a nice warm hug. This is it. from scratch might sound intimidating, but I promise it's actually pretty easy. After trying this recipe, you may never go back to that jarred stuff. I'm gonna kick things off with my curry paste. Traditionally, this is made in a mortar and pestle, but this girl is busy, so we're gonna put everything in a food processor and it comes out just great. So we're gonna first start with some coriander stems. So get those right into the food processor. Then we're gonna use one small shallot or a half of this large one here. And I like to quarter it so it's easier to blend up in the food processor. So get that right in. And then we're gonna use four cloves of garlic. One Thai green chili. You could just take the stem right off like this. And you could cut this in half if you'd like so it's easier to blend. And then we're gonna use one inch piece of fresh ginger. Fresh is key. The traditional ingredient in this is usually galango, but it's not readily available, so ginger is the next best substitute. And the best way to peel ginger is using a spoon, because if you run your spoon right against the meat of the ginger, the peel comes right off. How cool is that? So pop that right in. Next, we want half a stalk of fresh lemongrass. I'm just gonna give this a rough chop. And we're gonna get that beautiful lemongrass right in. I'm using one fresh lime. Let's get 
that all in. So then we want to just cut this in half. You can use your hand or a little citrus squeezer and give it a good squeeze. And we have a few more remaining ingredients. We want some toasted cumin seeds and some toasted coriander seeds. Then we want to add a pinch of white pepper. This is deceiving. White pepper is quite spicy, so a pinch is more than enough. And then a pinch of kosher salt. And we're going to whiz this up. And just keep pulsing. Okay, so I think we're good. So I'm gonna get it out into a bowl and then I'm gonna grab my veggies, tofu, and noodles for the rest of my recipe. So we've had our tofu here sitting in some paper towel. We've pressed it so you'll notice that it's a little bit drier from when you open the package. So I like small cubes because I want them to be bite-sized and able to fit on my spoon or fork. Plus, if you make them smaller, then they'll cook better and crisp up. Okay, the next step is tossing them in some cornstarch. So you just wanna lightly coat them. Great, so let's turn our skillet on. And we're gonna wanna get this to about a medium high heat. Coat the bottom with some neutral cooking oil. I'm gonna start giving them a flip. This is what you want. This is gonna be flavor packed. These are looking great. You could see the color, the crisp. So I'm gonna get them removed and then start prepping my veg. First, I'm gonna slice my onion. We're just using a medium to large yellow onion. So I'm gonna do a quick slice on each half. So our onion is done. And next we wanna do one long red chili. These actually aren't that spicy, but they're gonna add a lot of flavor and they're gonna look beautiful against the green curry. So we're just gonna give a quick slice on this, just basically thin circles. Great. And next we wanna slice a green bell pepper. This one's a big one. So cut this in half. And I just like to scoop out the center to clean it up. And then similarly, we're just going to run our knife through it like the way we did for the onion. Great. And lastly, we have some carrot. We're gonna try doing this julienne because I like it to match the onions and the peppers, okay? And now the one pan or pot magic begins. So we're gonna take the same pan that we use to crisp up our tofu in. While that's heating up, we're gonna coat it with a little bit more of that neutral oil. And now I'm gonna add in all of my veggies. Ooh, I always love that sizzle. Mm -hmm. So we wanna saute it for about five minutes or so. And to help with the process, we're gonna add in a bit of salt. The salt is gonna help release all of the moisture in the vegetables. Now that our onions are looking a little bit translucent, it's time for our curry paste. It smells so good. We're gonna let this cook down for about three to four minutes. Once you notice that the vegetables have softened and it's browning on the bottom, it's time for our liquids. So we're gonna add in about two cups of water. And some full fat coconut milk. And now is when we add our green peas. Stir this all together. And then we wanna bring this to a slow simmer. 
So while we wait for our curry to come to a slow simmer, I wanna talk about the noodles. So I'm actually using edamame noodles, which are noodles made out of edamame beans. They're super delicious and they're a beautiful green color. Okay, so our curry is simmering. So now it's time to add our noodles. You just wanna make sure all the noodles have some moisture on them. They're all covered with the liquid. Great. Then we're gonna cover it and let it cook for about five minutes. I'm gonna clean up some of these bowls and get ready to taste. Okay, so our noodles have been simmering for about five minutes, so let's give it a check. These will look so good. Notice that all the liquid has reduced, but it's still nice and saucy, and the veggies are still vibrant in color. All right, let's get it plated. So beautiful. I love the way the carrots look in this because they really add that pop of color. Okay, now for our tofu. We haven't forgotten about that. So they've actually cooled off here, which is great because now they're nice and crispy. And then we're gonna add some of our garnishes. So we have some fresh lime, some fresh coriander, and we reserved some of our fresh red chili. Look at this, can you believe this was made in only one pan? I just have to give this a taste. Are you kidding me? It's like I'm walking the streets of Bangkok. It's so vibrant, it's so fragrant. You should always eat with your eyes first. And this is certainly a dish that I'm eating with my eyes first. Good Thursday morning. That massive winter storm on the move. And it is causing a ton of problems from coast to coast. Morning, everybody. It's February 23rd, and this is today. Slammed. Tens of millions across more than half the country being impacted by snow, ice, and bitter cold. Hundreds of thousands waking up without power this morning.